time. The big concern is the weather forecast. Uh, we are continuing right now at a 50% probability of violation of the weather constraints. The big concerns are going to be the thick clouds, precipitation, possibility of lightning. I mentioned earlier, normally you get a strong sea breeze from the ocean that pushes inland and keeps the clouds from central Florida from building up. But today the sea breeze is fairly weak, so we expect the, the thunderstorms will get closer to the launch pad. We're also checking downrange conditions. If there's a contingency splashdown of Dragon, uh, we're looking at uh, essentially the wave heights, uh, lightning, rain along the trajectory. Right now it's marginal, but it is still go. We do that to improve slightly during the day. So fingers crossed there that the downrange weather looks good. But right now at T minus two hours, 41 minutes, as the clock continues to count down, all systems are go for launch. All right, thanks, John I. And as we watch Bob and Doug get buckled into their seats, I'm joined once again by SpaceX's Jessica Jensen just to kind of walk through everybody what made Dragon a 21st century spacecraft. So first off, thanks for coming in today. I know you got to come in for a launch. That's always tough. Of course. We wa Walk us through again kind of Dragon's life history. I mean, we have one in a clean room pretty soon right behind us. Walk us how we got to where we are today to have Bob and Doug climbing into that spacecraft. Sure, so SpaceX was founded to make life multiplanetary. That was why Elon started the company back in 2002. And, but you know, also when he founded the company, we were a very small company for several years. And so we had to look for opportunities to, you know, hey, how do you go from being a small company to actually putting people into orbit? So when NASA came out with the need to fly cargo to and from the International Space Station, we jumped on that because we said, hey, first, not only is carrying cargo to and from the space station cool, I bet we could actually then fly people to the International Space Station. And hey, for eight years now, we've been flying cargo. Yeah. And then now we are have transitioned over into flying crew and cargo together. So that's basically been the evolution of Dragon and it's been awesome. And I know when we see Falcon 9, we get to talk a lot about reusability. Everyone is very familiar with the, the first stage coming back down and yep. how cool that looks. Dragon is also designed with some reusability. In fact, you've flown Dragon multiple times or you've flown Dragons multiple times to the space station. How does reusability factor into Dragon's life cycle? Yeah, so I'll actually talk a little bit about both because I one thing I think everyone always thinks about reusability and hey, it saves money or that's great, but reusability actually improves your reliability. So when we get Falcons back and when we get Dragons back, either after one mission or multiple mission, we can do all these detailed inspections on them. And that's super important because when you fly a vehicle, you can only have so many sensors on it. You can't put a sensor, you know, every single inch of a rocket or a spacecraft. And there's already way more than I think anybody realizes. Exactly. But so, you know, especially for rockets that wind up in the ocean, some people don't have any idea of what they actually went through. So the fact that we get all the hardware back, we were able to inspect literally every square inch of it and make small design changes that actually improve reliability for the whole fleet. So even though Bob and Doug are on a brand new rocket and a brand new spacecraft, that those spacecraft are actually more reliable based on the knowledge we've learned from reusability. We've walked people through a lot of the new systems on Dragon. What are just some of the cool things that are maybe beneath the surface that people don't know about with Dragon? So I think one of the coolest things is the autonomous docking system. And what that is, is it's basically we have, you know, GPS sensors on Dragon, but then we also have cameras and um, imaging sensors such as a LIDAR on basically the nose cone or the front part of Dragon as it's approaching the space station. And all these sensors are feeding data back to our flight computer to say, hey, how far away am I from the space station? What's my relative velocity to the space station? And then that feeds into the flight computer, which has algorithms writ by, written by our engineers to say, OK, based on how far away you are in your rates, here's how you fire the thrusters to most effectively get to the docking target. Um, and I think that's just super cool. Well, I mean, we're all waiting for our cars to drive ourselves to work. And for Bob and Doug, that's exactly what it's doing for them. Exactly. And what I think is so cool is the computer does this just like flawlessly. It's easy. When I tried to do it, 
I failed miserably. I tried to dock Dragon to the ISS three times and I failed. SpaceX Fourth Dragon. time I got it. Good morning. Um, and I will tell the public out there that on our website, we actually have morning, a Dragon uh, ISS board. simulator. So you yourself can try and fire the thrusters and see how well you do. Maybe I'm just a bad driver but I think the flight computer does a really good job. I think we all had fun with it. All right, well, we are just starting to hear. They're gonna start up those comm checks with Bob and Doug. CDR, PLT, comm check. So let's listen in. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Umbilical comm check complete. Stand by for ground station comm check. And again, we're just listening in. They're doing these comm check, these communication checks. So Bob and Doug are going to do a series of these checkouts with the teams on the ground, both the core here in Hawthorne and the launch director out in Florida. And they're going to be doing this over Dragon to Ground. Uh, and they're also going to be doing it over the countdown net. Those are the two main loops or nets that you're going to hear going out. And they're going to be doing it through their different communications paths. We heard them do through the... Uh, TDRS or the tracking data and relay satellites. Those are those primary satellites that were going to be used to talk to Bob and Doug throughout their flight and to send commands to Dragon. They'll also do it through ground stations. SpaceX has a worldwide network of ground net uh, worldwide network of ground stations that they're able to communicate with the vehicle, and that's what we'll be using to get video inside the cabin of Bob and Doug on their flight up. So if you tuned in the other day, this is one of the first things that they do once they get inside the vehicle. And this is just to make sure all the communication systems with the Dragon spacecraft, with the suits, everything are working. They're able to talk to and hear everybody on the ground. Dragon, SpaceX, comm check, ground stations. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Core loud and clear, ground station comm check complete. Stand by for TJ's comm check. And just a reminder, you're hearing the core, that's the crew operations responsible engineer. That's if you followed NASA missions in the past, that's the CAPCOM position. That is this pretty much the singular voice that's talking to the astronauts throughout their flight. And that's a position based here in Hawthorne, California. And you'll also hear Dragon, SpaceX, Comcheck, Tetris. SpaceX Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. TGIS comm check complete. Stand by with comm checks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, MD on countdown one. Comm check. SpaceX uh, Jason, loud and clear. Copy, loud and clear. Glad to have you guys on board. Uh, stand by for comm check on Dragon to Ground. Dragon, MD, Dragon to Ground, comm check. MD, Dragon, loud and clear. MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, launch director on countdown one, comm check. Good afternoon, Mike. Loud and clear. I have you the same, and good afternoon. Stand by for my comm check on Dragon to Ground. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to Ground, comm check. SpaceX Dragon, loud and clear. I have you the same. Back to core. And Dragon SpaceX, this, this concludes our launch configuration comm checks. Report when ready for seat rotation per section two of 4.100. Dragon, I'll put that in work. Copy. All right, so all those communications checks were done successfully, and you could even see, and it's so cool when we get these views right inside the cabin. Space next, Dragon in two decimal two, we are ready for seat rotation. 
Copy. We will report when initiating. But you can see Doug Hurley using his right hand. He has the talk button built into the seat itself. So just, again, showing you all of the different systems, how the suit is integrated into the seat, and it's all just one big circle for this whole spacecraft. So really cool to see those comp checks live. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for walking us through some of the really cool updates, the upgrades. Did you have any other cool stuff besides? Let's see. So I don't know if you guys can see, but we have the Dragon Clean Room here. And one of the coolest things is it is right on the main floor of our main building. So thousands of employees walk by here all the time and get to see Dragon in its final processing before it goes to the Cape. On Wednesday, the Crew-1 capsule was in here. It looked almost done. It looks a little empty right now, but yeah. that's because that capsule went off into our separate test facility for its final propulsion checks. So we do leak checks and things there, and we do that in a separate facility just because it's high pressure testing. Um, and then the vehicle will come back here, get its final thermal protection system put on, and then it will ship off to Cape Canaveral and get ready to launch four astronauts to the International Space Station. I mean, what's, what's it like to see it? Because when you see the first initial pressure vessel, it looks nothing like the final thing. So yeah. what's it like to just kind of watch it go through and you just see little bits get added on, added on, and then the next thing you know, it's a whole spacecraft. Yeah, I mean, that's what's, that's what's so amazing. I'm so impressed. You know, when you look at a machine, you're like, how does this ever get built? How do people ever do this? And it really is just step by step, one piece at a time. Each piece has its critical function and you get to watch that being built right in front of your eyes every day when you Dragon, come to work. Dragon, SpaceX, as we are ready and initiating seat rotation. Dragon right. copies. And we just heard the seat rotations about to begin. So, Jessica, thank you so much. Yeah. Cool facts about Dragon for everyone to listen in on and we can see the seats start to rotate now. Pretty soon Bob and Doug will be in their launch configuration and they'll be ready to go. And we can see the seats slowly start to rotate. Again, they're in this down position just to make it easier to climb in and out of Dragon. They'll rotate to this launch position to put their backs a little bit more parallel to the ground. It, makes taking the G-Force a little bit easier for the crew on the way uphill, but most importantly, positions those touchscreens directly in front of them, which is just their gateway into Dragon. Dragon, SpaceX, seats are in the launch position. We copy. All right, and confirmation, the seats are in the launch position. Let's go down now to Gary in Mission Control Houston, where I know the entire JSC team is standing by and ready to see Dragon take flight today. Over to you, Gary. Thanks, Dan, very much so. Great to see good comm checks from Bob and Doug and that their seats have been rotated into their uh, launch position. Here in Houston, Flight Director Zeb Scoville has pulled space station flight controllers, and all systems are go for launch from the space station side of things. Essentially, the station is prepared for Dragon to arrive 19 hour, hours after launch. Chris Cassidy has completed his preparations uh, for Bob and Doug to arrive. He's got a chance to view some of the broadcasts. It even said they were, quote, looking sharp. Flight controllers here will monitor the countdown, but really it's up to the teams in Kennedy and Hawthorne to get us to lift off at this point. So we want to hear your comments as we continue to count down to launch. So let's go to the social desk now, Tahira. Thanks, Gary. So glad to hear that polls are go, at least on your end, and just hoping this weather just works out good for today's launch. I mean, people online are on the edge of their seats. We just checked numbers and we are up to 1.1 million viewers right now. That's almost double when we checked last time. And right now we also have Columbia, South Carolina is leading the viewership. So interesting to see how that changes. Let's take a broader look at the conversation online with this heat map of the United States. Now this shows Launch America mentions by state over the past week, and we have California leading right now with the most mentions. And I'm very surprised. I really thought the Space Coast would take it home, but let's see how this changes over the course of the broadcast. And with that, let's see what y'all are posting online right now. Guys, I mean, check out these outfits. Absolutely love it. Um, love to just see how people are making things creative for this launch and really making it their own, putting their personal touch on it. Let's take a look at another. Oh, we are back to the Launch America heat mentions. So let's see how that changes over the course of this broadcast. But 
really fun to see those photos online. Oh, we have another space pet, guys. These do not get old, so please use hashtag Launch America on social media. Right now, it looks like we have Catstronaut Boris, who is ready for his launch in the Crew Dragon capsule. I just, I love seeing the pet owners unite for this mission. So like I said, definitely use that hashtag. We will be looking for it during the show. Marie, what's the latest at Kennedy? Thanks to Hero, we are at T minus two hours, 26 minutes, 47 seconds and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 from the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida, carrying NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin. You see them right now aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft. It's been a very exciting day so far. The crew has been up since about eight o'clock this morning as they prepare to head to the International Space Station as part of this Demo 2 mission for NASA. And as we speak, the astronauts, as you saw, are inside Dragon and, are, and have completed their comm checks. So now they can communicate with the teams here on the ground. And their seats have rotated upright uh, to their reclined launch positions, allowing them to see and access the display panel. And now they are about to, they initiate their, their own suit leak checks to make sure that their seat is in proper working condition before liftoff. And in just a little bit, at about T minus one hour and 55 minutes, it could happen a little bit sooner though, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, um, we will see the closeout team begin to close the side hatch in preparation for flight. And that's gonna be one of the key visual milestones on the timeline to lift off. Now, we want to take you to a couple of special guests we have joining us. They are with Daryl Nail at the OSB2 viewing location, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, and also, Kennedy Space Center Director Bob Cabana is there with Daryl. Hi, Daryl. Hi, Marie. That's right. We're in the uh, fifth floor of the Operations and Support Building here at the Kennedy Space Center with a nice view of Launch Complex 39. And the two men that you mentioned are here to join me to answer a few questions. We're excited to have them both here. And they are, of course, Bob Cabana, the director of the Kennedy Space Center, and Jim Bridenstine, administrator for NASA. Gentlemen, thanks again for making the time to be here. Uh, of course, the big story right now, Jim, is the weather. So let's talk a little bit about that. We, we can see there's some clouds building. That was forecast. You took part uh, in a weather briefing this morning. Uh, what do you know about the weather and, and, and the decision that was made to say, hey, let's, let's give this another shot today? Yeah, so what got us last time was the electricity in the atmosphere. And of course, today there are, in fact, buildups. It doesn't look like there are thunderstorms at this time, but they are expected. Um, the question is, when do those thunderstorms go away? And when those thunderstorms materialize, where are they located? Um, we are predicting about a 50-50 uh, shot uh, of going this time. Um, but given the fact that we are in late May in Florida, um, we have to take every shot we can get. So um, it's not likely that uh, in, in a couple of days it's going to be any better than it is today. So we're, we're, we are a go for launch right now, um, and we are hoping that the weather will hold up. We almost made it on Wednesday, um, and the trend is better today than it was on Wednesday. So we'll see. And I saw a forecast that said the clearing is supposed to happen right around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So That's right. we're hoping that that launches uh, at 322, clearing right. you know, at the earliest 3 o'clock, at the latest 330. So depending on when that happens, uh, we'll, we'll either be go or no go. But um, again, uh, we're going to take every shot we've got. Also watching the downrange weather for a That's potential right. rescue in case there were an abort. That's right. So, you know, we have these staging areas. When we go from the first stage to the second stage, that's a higher risk evolution. We want to make sure that in the case we have to exercise the launch abort at that point, that the weather is good. And of course, that's off the coast of, of North Carolina. The big thing there is it's great that we have a launch abort capability. The challenge is that launch abort capability includes parachutes. And with parachutes, you've got to make sure that you've got the weather to come down. If there are thunderstorms or downbursts or high winds, uh, that's problematic for the parachute system. Right. And sea states as well, bouncing that exactly. capsule around in the ocean. Uh, Bob, of course, you're an astronaut. Uh, you know what it's like to hit the reset button and do it all over again. Get into the spacecraft, get ready to go, only to be told, no, we're not going to go today. We're going to try it again. What, what's that like? And then, and then tell me about the mindset as you have to kind of reset. Is there, do you feel less anxious? You, do you feel more comfortable the second time around? You know, Daryl, uh, first off, 
my last flight, we counted down to 18 seconds and didn't go, man, and when you get to 18 seconds, you're ready. Yeah. The key is, you know, it's the training that we go through. All the repetition that we do, we practice everything, including scrubs. And uh, just because you uh, didn't launch doesn't mean you don't have something to do. So you got to go through those back out procedures. It's all done very professionally. Then it was out of the vehicle and into the Astro van, back to crew quarters. And it, we had a positive attitude. We got a good night's rest. And we went through it again. It's just, it's a matter of doing your job, and these guys are well prepared. You know, it's all part of uh, what we do. Yeah, they, they stopped the count at 17 minutes, but you had it all the way up to just a few seconds. It's a big difference. And, and the truth is, the next night, actually, everything went really better. You know, the weather was bad the first time. I was kind of glad we scrubbed, and we scrubbed for a, an issue with the vehicle that they later sorted out. As it turned out, we wouldn't have had enough prop to rendezvous with the, the Russian car functional cargo block. but. You know, the next night, it was just a, a perfectly smooth launch count. Everything just went like clockwork, and uh, it set the stage for an awesome mission. I think you told the press before you walked out, uh, I think you were over there at Astronaut Crew Quarters, we're going today. <laughs> I, I'm wondering, uh, where's the source of that confidence coming from? I, I just got a feeling, you know, you got to have a positive uh -huh. attitude. I, you know, I, I watched a lot of weather down here uh, supporting shuttle missions, and I'm hoping that those clouds over the I-95 corridor that the Indian River keeps them west of, uh, west of us and that stuff that's building offshore is far enough off that we can stay, stay in an open window here at the Cape. Good. Well, we got your positive vibe going and we appreciate that. Um, Jim, when you were uh, down in the astronaut uh, crew quarters and, and when they were suiting up, you got a second chance to visit with the astronauts. Kind of tell us about that and, and what was their demeanor, what was their mood today? So uh, again, they seem loose. They were loose last time, they're loose this time. They're definitely ready to go. They're excited. Um, they've been wanting to go for a long time now. Um, you know, what was, I'll tell you one thing that I thought was a little interesting is, um, you know, Bob Benkin was making fun of Doug Hurley because on, on Doug's last flight, um, they scrubbed five times before launching on the sixth time. So Bob Benkin seems to think that Doug Hurley is the problem in this, <laughs> in this case. But to see them joking about that yeah. as they're getting suited up, ready to go, um, yes, they're, 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 they're trained, they're ready, but they're also loose. Um, and that's good to see because, um, because they're going to have to be on their game when, when we launch. These guys are, are, are pretty impressive, um, Doug Hurley and Bob Binken. I mean, Doug Hurley, an incredible pilot. Uh, Bob Binken, he, he's got a, a, a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering. I mean, and he's a flight test engineer himself right. in the Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, your, in your assessment, why are these guys the right stuff? Well, this is a test flight, um, and and you know we got we have great astronauts that are you know chemists. We have great astronauts that um, are botanists. We have really talented and diverse, a very very diverse astronaut corps in general. But this is a test flight, and for a test flight, what do you want? You want test pilots. You want people that um, for a living they have made a living flying new things that have never been flown before. And um, you know Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley are the the, the two people that you would want. Um, in a test flight, and that's exactly what this is. Bob, you're a pilot too. You want to weigh in on Doug Hurley. He seems like, uh, you know, he's, he's got the right mentality hey, what and can smooth I say? customer. He's a naval aviator, a marine pilot, a test pilot. Uh, he's all, I'm all in. He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and tell me a little bit about, um, in terms of the Kennedy Space Center, right? So uh, you've been here since 2007, right? 2008. 2008, sorry, yeah. off by one year. 2011, the Atlantis came to a wheel stop. Um, yeah, I grew up here. Uh, my dad worked for NASA. My uncle was a contractor. When that wheel stop happened, the next day, my uncle got the layoff notice, right? Yeah. And it, 30, 60 days. It was depressing. We're it, talking about thousands of people laid off. Super depressing. Atlantis landed on a Thursday. On Friday, 2,000 contractors got pink slips and walked out the door. Mm -hmm. Yet they worked on that vehicle. That was the best vehicle we ever flew, the cleanest. That's the dedication of the workforce here. Right. So and take me back to that time. You, you called it a depressing time. Um, you know, the fact that the shuttle program was something that the government completely uh, had ownership of and paid for. Now we're moving into this commercial crew, which you've overseen making that transition. And tell me about that nine years in, in which we made that move. Well, obviously, everybody was really attached to the shuttle. I mean, it was our history for 30 years and did an awesome job. The Hubble Space Telescope, all the satellites it deployed, building the International Space Station. But um, when I first got here, I told everybody, the shuttle program's going to end. We got we have to start preparing for our future. And, and nobody wanted that 
to hear that. But how many times in your life do you get to define what you want your future to be? And we set out on this bold goal of trying to turn KSC into a multi-user spaceport, supporting both government and commercial operations. And uh, I've got a very persistent team. They worked extremely hard and through a number of agreements, you know, we were able to make it happen. And this is the future. Commercial spaceflight, you know, the administrator says it all the time. We want to establish uh, a commercial environment in low Earth orbit so that we can focus on the hard job of exploring beyond our home planet, to establish that presence in our solar system beyond planet Earth, establish a sustained presence on the moon, get to Mars, establish a presence there. We can't do that if we're locked here in low Earth orbit. And commercial crew with both SpaceX and Boeing, that's the beginning of a whole new era of spaceflight. All right, very good. Um, quick question, we've got, of course, a special guest coming uh, back today. The President of the United States plans on being here. Um, Jim, you took him around the first time around. How did that go? I, I think I saw a picture on Twitter. He signed some space hardware. That's right, so, uh, so he took a look at the Orion crew capsule. Of course, uh, the Orion for Artemis One is ready to go, um, and he signed, uh, you know, a piece of hardware that will fly on the crew capsule for Artemis Two. Um, so that's kind of, in, and not just him, but the, the first lady and the vice president and the second lady, they all signed it. So, um, so their names are going to fly around the moon on Artemis Two, which is exciting. But I just want to give uh, Colonel Cabana a compliment here because he did bring this spaceport through a very difficult time. And now it is a, a multi-use spaceport, and we do have commercial, and we have, in fact, even international launches here, and now we're gonna have commercial crew launches. Uh, Bob has done a wonderful job transforming this spaceport. That's why we're doing commercial crew. NASA wants to be one customer of many customers. We, we wanna have numerous providers that are competing on cost, innovation, safety, driving down costs, increasing access, but even better today, uh, when I took this job just uh, a few short years ago, you know, our budget at NASA was around $19 billion. The budget request that President Trump gave us for next year is $25 billion. We are in a great, great position because the President is committed to space exploration. Of course, he's committed to the Space Force. We haven't had this much support for space since John F. Kennedy, and we've got bipartisan support. Everybody wants to see the Artemis program be successful. Everybody wants to see not just the next man, but the first woman on the moon, and that's what we're building here. Yeah, that's key to, the, key to it all is that bipartisan support. And of course, um, what the work that Bob's been doing here, you can see the commercial activity all around this place. Um, we're gonna get to some questions on social media real quick that uh, our, uh, you know, our audience wants to find out. So the first question is from James on Twitter, and he asks, what is the hardest part of going to space? We're going to have to give that question to Bob. Well, Daryl, you know, nothing's hard if you prepare for it. And uh, what we are afraid of is, a, is stuff we don't have knowledge about. And that's what we do when we learn how to be astronauts. We train, okay? You spend a long time as an astronaut candidate learning. You spend a long time preparing for a mission, for an International Space Station mission, training around the world on all the different uh, modules and everything. You know, it's like two and a half years of training before you get on orbit for that uh, time to actually do your work. So I'd have to say the hardest part is the preparation for it. But you are so prepared when you go. You just have total confidence. You know that you are very well trained for what you're going to do. You have an outstanding team on the ground supporting you. And that is so important to have that ground support as you uh, climb into that vehicle. You know that they've done their very best to ensure your safety and, uh, and a successful mission. But uh, after that, it's a piece of cake, except no simulator on Earth can prepare you for what those guys are going to feel. It's better than a cat shot off an aircraft I, I, carrier. I believe it. Maybe one day I'll get to try. The commercialization effort means we want everybody to be able to fly into space. Yeah, that's absolutely. The it's a great point about preparation because that's not the highly visible part. The launch is, and so it's good to know that uh, all that preparation leads to that confidence. Um, by the way, just an update uh, operationally. They're uh, getting ready to close the hatch door. You can see uh, on your screen there the, uh, the workers there are uh, getting ready to get that closed and uh, working, on, uh, working on that right there with uh, Doug, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Binkin on the inside of Crew Dragon. Our next question is from Mathis on Twitter and he asks, what kind of operations will the astronauts do between the liftoff and docking with the International Space Station? I know you pay a lot of attention, Jim, to the operations, uh, especially of this mission. You bet. What do you know about that? So there's a number of things. The first thing that they have to do is, of course, we've got a number of burns 
to get in phase with the International Space Station. We've got um, some boost burns as well. We're talking about you know operating the rocket engine to, to get in alignment with the space station. But I, I'll tell you, the biggest thing that we need the astronauts to do once they get on orbit and before they dock is rest. We need them to eat. We need them to rest. We need them to be prepared for that docking. Uh, once they are in the range of the International Space Station, um, they're going to start maneuvering the spacecraft themselves. Not automatic, but they're going to do it themselves. They are, in fact, test pilots. And as test pilots, they will test fly this vehicle to make sure that it operates as advertised. And of course, then they will dock with the International Space Station. And a unique capability here is it's automatic rendezvous and automatic docking. And so um, we're going to be able to see that for the first time as well. That's going to be exciting to see. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Jim Bridenstein, Administrator of NASA, Bob Cabana, Director of the Kennedy Space Center. Thank you both for joining us. And we're going to send it back to Marie in the studio. All right, thanks a lot, Daryl and Mr. Bridenstine and Mr. Cabana for joining us. Um, you can see some clouds starting to gather over Launch Complex 39A. We're keeping a close eye on weather. Again, 50-50% chance of launching today. We just got to see what the weather's going to do. Um, a little bit ago, we heard the crew complete uh, their comm checks live on the air. We saw their seats rotate. That helps get them into a little bit more comfortable position for the G-forces during launch. And more importantly, it helps them be in a better position um, to interact with the screen in front of them. They completed their suit leak checks. Um, we saw during the interview just a few minutes ago the hatch uh, begin to close and so inside the white room there the pad closeout team is in there um, still doing some work that that hatch closes you know it's not as simple as just closing a car door. There's a process um, to seal it and check it and make sure that uh, everything is sealed properly. Right Lauren? Yeah that's correct. <clears throat> if they haven't already started uh, one thing that will be coming up next is the leak check. Uh, what they'll do is they'll attach a, uh, a piece of ground support equipment. They don't have it in their hands right now, so um, it looks like it hasn't started yet. Ah, there it is. You can see it there. Uh, the uh, closeout member number five, it's already attached to the side hatch mechanism. And what they'll do is um, they're essentially checking for the leak rate and uh, they'll hold pressure there for a few minutes and then track that change in pressure over time to make sure that it's within bounds, making sure that you don't have any issues with those O-rings there that are holding that pressure. And so once they complete that leak check, they will then do what is the uh, called the installation of, or the final installation of the SPEP, or side pressure equalization plug. That's basically a, a plug that um, once the capsule splashes down, what you'll do is um, actually remove that, and what it does is equalizes pressure across the hatch. So once that thing is plugged in, you know that everything is, is super tight and that you shouldn't have any leaks on orbit. One of the other things that I think is pretty cool about Dragon, you can kind of see them uh, on the edges there are some of the windows, and I know that Dragon started out as car it was cargo dragon. You have your cargo version and before you moved on to the crew dragon version, but you even had windows on the cargo version. Can you t explain kind of why that was? Yeah, the very first cargo dragon that we ever had that we ever launched um, had a window over the hatch, over the side hatch. And the reason we did that is we always envisioned Dragon to ultimately be a crewed vehicle. So even in the beginning for the first, the very first vehicle we ever made, which carried, didn't even really carry much cargo, um, we put that window there and it to us symbolizes what Dragon's purpose has been all along. You know, th taking those steps, starting off with the, uh, the CRS program and resupplying the, the space station with, with experiments and, and food and crew provisions uh, for the astronauts on board to now putting our own astronaut or putting NASA's astronauts in our own vehicle. Um, it's that natural progression to what we were aiming for the whole time. Mm -hmm. And Leland, what's your take on the touchscreen technology? We saw a little bit about that, obviously. This is a very different kind of look um, than what we saw during the space shuttle. We know it's the future. I mean, we had our, our LCD displays and we had lots of buttons to press and 
you know, valves and switches. And I think this this new technology will allow us to get through procedures much more fast, you know, much much faster. Because we had, you know, paper flight data file that we we're having to turn to different pages and get to things. And I think this will make it much more efficient to go through your malfunctions and your procedures with the touch screens. And I think, you know, having the gloves being able to, you know, touch the screens and work within the gloves. Um, Everything's kind of sleek and efficient. You know, there's not a lot of wires and things hanging off. And there are knee boards. You can see there are knee boards on their left knees. And so that's for some extra little notes and things. The, uh, the hatch is closed now. There's some commentary. Uh, we are ready for the post ingress briefing when you are ready to copy. And we just heard confirmation on the loops that the hatch is closed. So that is a little bit ahead of schedule. We are motivated to go today. <laughs> We're ready. Go ahead. Okay. On the weather, uh, we still have some rain showers moving through the area, uh, but we do have a reasonable opportunity today, so we are proceeding into the counts. Uh, we are going to take a look at both pad and ascent track weather at T minus one hour and 30 minutes, and the next decision point will be prior to prop load. Okay, we copy. And on the vehicle health front, both F9 and Dragon Health remains nominal uh, with no items of note. So we just heard the weather is still iffy. Good news, thank you. The weather is still iffy. And this concludes the post ingress brief. Uh, report when ready for contracts with Falcon 9 operators. We are ready for the uh, F-9 operators. Copy. Expect that shortly. So when we hear that chatter pick back up, we're going to quiet right down so that you can listen into that along with us. But we just heard them discussing the weather briefly, still keeping an eye on that. But the next decision point is going to be uh, before prop load. So we're going to press forward for now and then reevaluate on before they start fueling the rocket. But in the meantime, it sounds like Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon are healthy. So um, the vehicle's in good shape, right? It sounds like kind of a little bit of a repeat from Wednesday that we're just keeping an eye on the weather at this point. You can see on their left legs, well, in that previous image. And Dragon SpaceX com checks with F9. Uh, you can expect it in about one to two minutes. Dragon's ready. All right, on their left legs there, they have the satchels that are strapped to their legs. Inside are some crew provisions, including these tablets that you see uh, that they have displayed there. You say, Lauren, those are tablets versus just knee boards that you can write on? Uh, or the tablets are inside. Oh, they're inside, yes. okay, okay. And so when would they pull those tablets out to use them? Uh, during the mission, okay. while, yeah, while on orbit. Okay. And I don't know if it's coming, if the, the background noise is coming through over the air, but we hear the rain really picking up outside the studio here. So I'm kind of wondering if Bob and Doug are hearing the sounds of the rain clouds opening up over the pad. It looks like they're, it's still kind of patchy out there. But again, we were following some thunderstorms that look like they may be making their way over here it it kind of looks like it's raining from that view it's kind of it's a little bit hard to tell through the haze all right lunch launch is now uh just over two hours away Tahira, you are there with the social teams. Now that the hatch is closed and the rain's picking up and all kinds of exciting things are going on right now as we count down and get into the last two hours of the count, I bet things are getting pretty interesting on social media. Hey, Lauren. I mean, yes, they are. So many different things are going on right now. And I think people online are just wondering what's going to happen with today's mission. I have TweetDeck open right now, and it is just scrolling with the conversation of people around the nation talking about today's launch attempt. We also just checked viewership, and we are now up to 1.4 million people watching this live broadcast. So really hope things look good with weather. And on that note, let's take a look at some of the things being said on Twitter right now. 
So it looks like, oh, we just have some more future astronauts. I really love seeing the young generation just getting mobilized, getting excited about today's mission. Looks like we've also got some Godspeed and safe travels for both astronauts today. Um, really do wish them the best of luck on the second attempt. Hope it happens. Some throwback photos, all from people visiting NASA centers, and also just let's do this. I love this can-do attitude, and I just love seeing that people are still keeping the energy alive for today's launch. So there were obviously some disappointing reactions to Wednesday's scrub, but let's take a look at how people are getting excited for today's attempt. Let's roll. <laughs> Ready to launch America. Three, two, one, go! Ready to lift off? I mean, how fun is that video? I think I will definitely have to attempt the worm after this, but just really glad to see everyone in good spirits leading into today's second launch attempt. And I really hope everybody will have something to smile about. And with that, let's head back to Lauren. Lauren. Thanks to hear it. So it looks like people are pretty stoked about today's attempt. Please continue to join the conversation by using the hashtag launch America across all the social media channels. Yeah, I love seeing, I really love seeing the little kids uh, get excited. I know my, my three-year-old is super excited. She's got an astronaut sleeping bag and really? she loves to climb <laughs> in it. Yeah, it's the, the body of the bag is a spacesuit, and then the head is, is empty where, they, where the pillow is. So when she gets inside, it looks like she's got a spacesuit on. So she loves <laughs> it. That's the inspiration for that next generation of explorers are going to take Doug and Bob's place one day. And uh, I think we have some people out there that are so interested in our conversation about the worm and the meatball that they've created something called the worm ball. What? <laughs> yeah, I saw, I was checking my email during that because you're like, I emailed you guys the worm ball and I was like, what is this? I, I don't, I'm having a hard time seeing it, but what is the worm ball? So it's a, it's a NASA meatball, which is, you know, what it should be. Yes, yes. Okay, look at okay. it. There it is. All right, oh, thank you. I need yeah. a visual. So they okay. took the, the angular NASA logo and put in the worm inside of the meatball. Can you, can you live with that, Lauren? You know what? That's a beautiful compromise. I'll take it. I'll take it. it. <laughs> it's a nice marriage of the two. Oh, I love you, man. Yeah, so <laughs> truth. truth. And uh, there is another live look at Launch Complex 39A, and we have had the opportunity to share with you a lot about the SpaceX Crew Dragon sitting on top of Falcon 9, a lot about the crew themselves, and the significance of today as the official return, we hope, of human launch capability to American shores. But we would be remiss if we did not explain why this pad, 39A, is how ground. Where go, same time, where go. Altitude, velocity, light. Many of NASA's storied missions began their daring journey from the exact same spot on Earth. Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. This massive structure of steel and concrete has cradled rockets and guided each on their fiery ascent to space for over 50 years. There can be no launch without a launch pad, and this hollow ground has a history greater than any other. Having evolved and been reshaped for each new era of space flight, it's alive with a heartbeat as strong as the first. Launchpad 39A came to life under the direction of project engineer Harry May as NASA ramped up its efforts to achieve an unprecedented calling. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, 
Why climb the highest mountain? In 1962, Earth Moving Machines sculpted its massive pyramid base to a height of 40 feet. Then, concrete was poured to hold it in place. To launch the world's first moon rocket, engineers cut a flame trench nearly the length of two football fields down the middle of the mound. It was then lined with heat-resistant bricks to deflect seven and a half million pounds of earth-rattling thrust, first felt on Apollo 8. Less than a year later, Apollo 11 launched from Pad 39A. And hundreds of millions of people around the world watched as it landed on the moon three days later. Nearly a decade after this Apollo era, 39A again took center stage with a new, one-of-a-kind spacecraft, the Space Shuttle. Millions of pounds of additional steel for service structures transformed the look, but not the purpose, human spaceflight. In all, 82 space shuttles blasted off from 39A until the very last start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. All three engines up and burning. 2, 1, 0, and liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. Roger roll, Atlantis. With the fleet retired, demolition crews removed the shuttle-era hardware to clear the way for NASA's monumental decision to lease this historic launch site to the private company SpaceX. Today, its sleek and modern design supports a family of rockets that has advanced the commercial age of American spaceflight. Now, 50 years after it first sent humans to the moon, this historic spaceport stands ready for the next wave of human exploration. And we're looking live again at pad 39a we're looking at the pad closeout team you can um, identify them by their numbers there and we heard confirmation of the hatch uh, being closed just a few minutes ago so again things a little bit ahead of schedule and when i say ahead of schedule i don't mean the launch time is changing i just mean um, some of the specific milestones in the timeline those times are a little bit flexible but that launch window remains instantaneous at 322 this afternoon um, and leland you know we just saw a piece about the history of pad 39a all stations, all stations chief engineer and countdown one for comm check with the crew we're going to pause for that comm check falcon 9 guidance navigation and control dragon gnc on countdown one comm check gnc dragon we have you loud and clear gnc loud and clear stand by for comm check by the propulsion engineer Dragon prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop, Dragon, loud and clear. Prop, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics, Dragon, loud and clear. Avionics, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by ground segment engineer. Dragon ground segment on countdown one, come check. Ground segment, Dragon, loud and clear. Ground segment, loud and clear, stand by for come check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, come check. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear, stand by for come check by the chief engineer. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Countdown 1, comm check. Chief Engineer, Dragon, we've got you loud and clear, Bala. 
Chief Engineer, loud and clear, this completes the Falcon 9 Responsible Engineer comm check. And we just saw a thumbs up from Doug Hurley. We listened to a series of comms, comms checks there, and so um, everything... Dragon. Chief Engineer on Dragon to Ground. Loud and clear on Dragon to Ground. Uh, loud and clear. Well, good luck, and let's see if the rain clears up. That sentiment is shared by all here. Do it. Copy that. So Bob and Doug, along with the launch teams and all of the rest of America, hoping the rain clears up here. Uh, but as far as comp checks go, um, everything uh, sounded pretty normal, pretty nominal there. Uh, so we're just waiting on the weather to clear up. Um, but again, there's a live look at Launch Complex 39A, the site of 82 space shuttle uh, missions where they began. And of course, Apollo, uh, the first mission to the moon, Apollo 11 lifted off from 39A. And Leland, you were just five years old when that happened. Take yeah. us back there. Marie and Lauren, I was five and I was the antenna engineer during the broadcast. I was the kid <laughs> standing behind the black and white Sylvania television holding the rabbit ears and my dad said, move to the left, move to the right. <laughs> and I was trying to look around the television to see what was going on, but I, they said, no, 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 don't move, stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so I never actually saw the actual you know, landing on the moon, Neil and Buzz walking on the moon. And the next day, all the friends, my friends in my community were like, yeah, you wanna be an astronaut? We just had this momentous thing. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it. I want to be Arthur Ashe because Arthur Ashe trained five blocks down the street from where I grew up. And my dad talked about his, his excellence, his perseverance, his, his athleticism. And so it wasn't until I got to NASA uh, working as an engineer at NASA Langley that a friend of mine said, you'd be a great astronaut. And I'm, I just laughed at him. And I didn't fill the application out. But another friend of mine got in, Charlie Camarda. And I said, if he can become an astronaut, I can become <laughs> one. So I applied the next year and I got in, in the 1998 class. And I think about this, again, storied legacy, Pat 39A. I was uh, there in 2008 and 2009, Space Shuttle Atlantis, the last one that came in with Doug and the rest of the crew. And it's just a, an amazing time to see this new era with Lauren, with your SpaceX Crew Dragon about to take off. I never heard that story. <laughs> That's I've got a million what? stories. <laughs> a million <laughs> stories. <laughs> wow. It's, it's so cool that, you know, you do have a lot of these kids that are watching today who have never seen mm -hmm. a, a flight, a human space flight mm -hmm. uh, from KSC before. And um, this is their first time. And I'm trying to remember back, you know, I, I grew up in the shuttle era and I grew up in Los Angeles. And I remember sometimes when the shuttle would land at Edwards Air Force Base, mm -hmm. you'd hear those sonic booms. Double and sonic boom. You boom hear boom. the double sonic booms yeah. in school. And, and we all just knew, oh, that's the space shuttle. It was just right. the thing. We right. just knew about that. And it did make me sad that there's a, like an entire generation of, of kids who didn't grow up with that experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so proud that you know, today, hopefully, we get to provide that for kids and hopefully have more and more of these launches to the point where it becomes routine, hopefully never right. boring, but routine. And yeah. there's talent in every zip code, so you have to make sure that every kid is, has the opportunity to do these types of things. If they believe in themselves, then we give them the right tools that they can use to be in STEM fields. And, you know, we have a very diverse group of people mm -hmm. up here working together to get Bob and Doug off safely. And I think more people that see this type of diversity will have a chance to say, I can do that too. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, we have a lot of kids watching today and we have an opportunity to hear from another really awesome role model, especially for the little girls in the audience. So we want to throw it over to Gary in Houston to talk to a very special astronaut standing by there. Hi, Gary. Hi, Marie. I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by one of NASA's record-setting astronauts and a recent resident aboard the space station, Christina Cook. Christina, thank you for joining us. It's great to be with you today. Christina, we're coming up on 20 years of continuous human presence on the International Space Station, and you were one of those humans. What's it like to see a new milestone like this launch unfold after so much history already? 
You're right, so much history indeed, and it's just been great to watch it all unfold. I think for me, the most exciting thing is how NASA is not only innovating in what we do, ex you know, exploring the universe, pushing the boundaries, getting knowledge on the space station, bringing it back to Earth for benefits here, but in how we do it. We're innovating in the implementation of the, those goals and of our mission. And what that means is that bringing in the private sector, bringing in a commercial space economy for low Earth orbit means space is going to be more accessible and more innovative. And it's just an awesome new era of history to be able to witness. You hold the record for the longest single stay by a female astronaut in space. What's it like living aboard for so long? Well, it is truly a privilege every single day, I have, to, I have to say. It's a beautiful thing to look down on the Earth and to be able to kind of contribute to a space program that you yourself has, have held in such high regard your entire life. I would say that the biggest challenge going into sort of those longer times is remaining vigilant. The engineers make it so easy to live on board the space station. Sometimes you forget you're actually surrounded by such a hostile environment. So uh, remaining vigilant both day to day to have that appreciation and that you wake up with every day and then also being vigilant, knowing that things could take a turn for the worse at any time, and you have to be ready to react to that. So um, it's a great privilege, but it also comes with great responsibility. You came to NASA after the days of the shuttle program, and you flew on the Russian Soyuz. What does it mean to have this private capability to fly astronauts to the station? Well, I think it's just a great innovation in terms of our partnerships. You know, when we started out, it was individual countries pursuing space exploration. We brought in the international aspect of it, and now we're really folding in that commercial aspect, bringing the innovation of all of our American industrial power and recognizing that the more partnerships we have, the more accessible, the more innovative space exploration can be. So it's an awesome time, and it brings with it so much more capability into the program as well. So it's not only how we're doing it, but it's what it brings. We're looking forward to having this transportation from private companies. How does it help you do your job in space? You know, I think uh, what one concept that we have in NASA for safety and to mitigate risk is called dissimilar redundancy. And here now, we're bringing up a whole second way of getting crew to the International Space Station and getting cargo, last minute cargo. So we're increasing how much science we can do on board the space station by twofold. We're increasing how we can, you know, our options for getting items up, stowage items, um, supplies, provisions, science experiments. So we're really just, Bank banking on the extra redundancy to make the program that much more robust. We're watching Bob and Doug go through the final phases of preparing for this launch. What's going through your mind so close to liftoff? Oh, it is such a great day indeed. You know, it's interesting because I think it's not so much what is going through your mind, but what's not going through your mind. You know, you're not thinking about all the things could go wrong. You're thinking about enabling success by doing what you've been trained to do. One of the sayings we have is that on launch day, astronauts are sometimes the most calm people in the room. And I found that to be true on my launch day too. I think it's kind of this career culmination of everything you've learned, everything you've dreamed of, and you know that it's coming together in that day and that you're gonna finally do what you're prepared to do, execute the mission, and it just really brings a sense of calm and readiness. NASA astronaut Christina Cook, always an honor to hear from you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, once Bob and Doug arrive at the station, NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy will be ready to welcome them on board. So in anticipation of their launch, he had this message for them. Hello, everyone. I'm astronaut Chris Cassidy, commander of Expedition 63 on board the International Space Station, flying 250 miles above the Earth. Like you, I'm excited about today's launch and the possibilities it will bring to America and to the world. But also, I'm very excited that two close friends will be arriving and joining the crew. I had the privilege of flying with Doug Hurley on both of our first shuttle missions back in 2009. Together, we came to the International Space Station and helped construct the amazing facility that it is today. Although this will be my first mission with Bob, it was my honor to follow him as the chief of the office when he left back in 2015 to begin training for this amazing mission. Personally, I've been very fortunate to fly in two different spacecraft. Launching from America on the shuttle, and most recently launching from Kazakhstan in the Soyuz. But I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that we're once again launching Americans from the coast of Florida. And finally, here's a story I'd like to share with you. Back in 1981, John Young and Bob Crippen launched on Space Shuttle Columbia, the very first space shuttle flight, marking the last time we flew Americans on a brand new vehicle. Orta 
With them, they flew an American flag representing America's technical prowess. Roger roll, Atlantis. Thirty years later, that same flag was flown to the International Space Station. This flag remains here today, waiting for Bob and Doug. Our flag means so many things to our country, and this small piece of America represents what we'll be able to achieve together. We'll never stop exploring. And so Bob and Doug can take this very special flag home to Earth, where it awaits its next journey to the cosmos. In a few years, the first Orion crew will take this flag with it around the moon. All of this starts today. I'll be watching outside the window along with everyone else in America and around the world. I can't wait to look out the window and see my friends on close approach. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and go Bob and Doug. I'll see you soon. And there again is a live look at Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we are T minus one hour, 41 minutes, 58 seconds and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket carrying Crew Dragon with astronauts Bob, Bank Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley strapped inside. Uh, we can see some raindrops on the screen there. Um, it looks like rain coming down at the pad, but we're still uh, monitoring weather and it sounds like there's going to be another decision point before they start fueling uh, the Falcon Falcon 9 rocket, which is scheduled to happen at about T minus 35 minutes. So uh, we just heard a little bit about where they're headed. Uh, if the weather cooperates today to the International Space Station, Leland, you've been there twice. And I know um, just from what you've told us, it's, it's this Leviathan in space and <laughs> the site of so much important work and partnerships happening. Right. Chris Cassidy is up there floating in the Columbus Laboratory that I installed, or our team of us installed um, on STS-122. And I think about, you know, using this robotic arm that was made in Canada, the European Space Agency built the Columbus Laboratory, and my job was to use that arm and attach it to the International Space Station. And as it was getting closer and closer, the motion just stopped. And I'm like, what is going on? And there are four ready to latch indicators that have a very slight spring force that I was moving so slowly with the hand controller, the translational hand controller, that that, that spring force stalled out the motion. And Peggy Whitson was behind me and she Go said, ahead, Leland, there's some commentary. Weather update, I think. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Doug, we're still waiting for a weather update expected at 18 Zulu. Uh, therefore, the next assessment will be closer to the propellant load time. Uh, we are currently no-go in launch weather, but we are showing an expected clear of 1830 Zulu. Okay, copy all. Thanks for the update. So we just heard if, if they were to launch right now, the weather would be no-go. However, it sounds like there may be an opportunity um, if the weather clears, as it sounds like they expect it may. So again, we're going we're gonna to keep listening um, as we continue talking. If we start to hear any kind of chatter, especially if it's about the weather, we're going to do our best to quiet down so that we don't step on that and, and everyone can hear it along with us. Uh, but Leland, you were just talking about uh, the work on station and, and Peggy Whitson was getting ready to tell you something. <laughs> well, uh, so the Columbus <laughs> Laboratory is stalled out, is about to be attached, and there were 10,000 people waiting. Their job security depended on me installing this thing properly. Right. And Peggy said, Leland, push just a little bit harder on the hand <laughs> controller, and all four ready to latch indicators went green. And I was like, yes, and that was our primary mission objective, but that paled in comparison to what happened next. Peggy invited us over to dinner in the Russian segment, and we had this meal with people from all over the world, Russian, German, French, African-American, Asian-American, this diversity that we talked about earlier, were up there breaking bread at 17,500 miles per hour while listening to Sade's Smooth Operator. Right. It yeah. blew my mind. It was Smooth yeah. Operator, right? You what know? an appropriate yeah. song for the, I know. For the job, too, right? And wow, does she know? She, she knows oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> and Dan Tani actually changed the song to from smooth operator to arm operator. Uh -huh. So you see arm operator. <laughs> 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 Love it. Love it. 
And Leland, you actually, uh, we were in an, another taped segment when you got a text uh, from yeah. Drew Foistel. Can you can you share that with us? Yeah, Drew Foistel, his good friend, just sent me a text saying that uh, the families say hello to all who are watching and thank the nation and the world for their support and interest. And Chris Ferguson just actually sent me a text. He was the commander on STS 135 and one of my classmates from the 1998 class. And he says, way to go, Scott Speed on Crew Dragon. That's awesome. Yeah. It's great to, to hear those words of support. Thank you guys for watching and everybody following along at home. I mean, uh, the the COVID-19 situation has been just a just a tough time for people stuck inside, um, homeschooling their kids, still trying to do their jobs. And so it's yeah. it's really cool to be able to uh, to watch this happening. And we see the pad closeout team uh, looks like they are getting ready or they, like they've left the the white room and they've already come down the crew access arm. So they are getting ready to leave the pad now. And we are going to go now to uh, the Operations and Support Building 2, where Daryl Nail is standing by with NASA's Chief of Staff to talk to us a little bit about some of NASA's ambitions uh, beyond the International Space Station and its work with the Commercial Crew Program. Daryl? Yeah, that's right. We're here in the, the Mission Briefing Room at uh, the top of Operations and Support Building here, where there's a lot of important people that are gathering to watch the launch here. And one of those people is not me, by the way. One of those people that is important is Gabe Sherman. NASA's Chief of Staff, we appreciate you being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Daryl. You got kind of the insight of what's coming down the sure. pike here at, at NASA. So of course, today is commercial crew, and we're focused on that, and seeding the commercial market. But what's off in the horizon for NASA? Well, I'll just tell you, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time to be at NASA, and you know this. I mean, you're here every day. Uh, but whenever you think about what we're doing with commercial crew, uh, you know, in the horizon uh, in July, we're launching Mars Perseverance, which is just going to be an incredible, incredible thing for us. You look at the end of this year, you know, SLS, the largest rocket in the world, is, is going through testing right now, going through green run testing. And, and we're hoping maybe by the end of the year we could even get it right out here to the Cape, mm -hmm. um, which would be a, just an incredible achievement for our team. So um, there is no shortage of things to be excited about at NASA right now. And it feels like everything is really starting to happen here recently with everything that you just mentioned. And if we get that first Artemis launch, that could be right around the corner as well. Oh man, you know, we're looking at, uh, I think late 2021 is what we're looking for. Um, and so you, you think about SLS potentially moving through from the green run to the Cape. Um, you've got Orion finishing up its last little bit of testing. It moved from Plumbrook um, earlier this year, our, our, our station up there in Ohio, down to KSC. So we're looking at uh, checking it out throughout next year. And hopefully we'll have the first integrated flight of SLS and Orion at the end of 2021. And I'm telling you, that, that is going to be a moment. That will be exciting. Yeah. And there will be a thunderous boom right here at the yes. Kennedy Space Center. Um, so with Mars as the end goal, mm -hmm. how, do, how does all of this get to that end point? You bet. No, and I think that's what's so important about the Artemis program, right? Our, our long-term vision is to get to Mars. But, you know, when you think about Artemis, everything that we're doing at the moon is helping us learn, prove out capabilities and technologies, work through the, the right mission durations, understand how we utilize the resources of the moon potentially to go further onto Mars. So the technology, the science, the exploration, um, architecture that we're putting together, each and every piece of it is helping us learn a little bit more, prove out a little bit more so we can take that next giant leap to Mars. And so everything that we're doing at the moon helps prepare us to move on to Mars. How about the activity in low Earth orbit, like commercial crew, which is happening uh, today? Yeah. How does that help us for missions to the moon? Yeah, I think anytime you're launching humans, you're learning, right? And you're taking what you've learned and you're you're moving it forward to the next to the next mission. But I think it's really about the business case. If you think about what commercial crew is, it's NASA moving from owning and operating hardware to buying a service, right? And if you remember, just a few weeks ago. Um, Man, we awarded three contracts on the human landing system to commercial companies. And so we're hoping that we move to a day where we're actually buying a service to get our astronauts back and forth to the moon. Um, so actually enabling com the commercial market to go from low Earth orbit all the way out to lunar orbit. And so commercial crew is a great proving ground for that. Um, helps us prove out that business case, build those partnerships, and then we get a feed forward to the moon. So. It's, uh, it means a lot. This means a lot as we move out. And, and it's really exciting when you talk about uh, the commercial crew, the commercial, commercial aspect going to the moon right. and those partners. Um, they're going to be studying those landers uh, to see if they are viable for NASA? Yeah, working through a, a, tre 
tremendous process of with with the commercial providers and NASA engineers going through initial designs right now looking at at the, the capabilities that they've proposed and then trying to make decisions on which which landing system goes early in 2024 which landing systems are better prepared for sustainability out in the, the later 20s and so that is going to be an ongoing process throughout this year and moving into next um, so it's going to be really exciting to kind of see what what comes out is hey this is the lander that's going to take the first woman and the next man to the moon in 2024. Right so different than the time of Apollo when we right. went to the moon yeah. and that program ultimately came to an end. Right. Uh, the idea here though is to try to create some sustainability. Talk right. about that. Right and sustainability y you can get to sustainability if you have reusability right and that's that's what we're seeing with commercial crew for sure um, but whenever you think about our human landing system um, you're, you're looking at a system that we put out there at the moon once we get to sustainability and it's going back and forth taking multiple trips to the lunar surface back up to gateway which um, you're familiar with this kind of our, our smaller space station we're going to put in orbit around the moon um, so we're we are building an architecture that is going to enable reusability at the moon apollo never had that and so whenever you think about driving down cost and increasing access reusability sustainability are critical so you get to see everything from a very high level at NASA. What's it like for you personally, I'm curious, to be here at the Kennedy Space Center uh, to watch a launch and, and to just see this amazing facility where all of this activity happens? Yeah. I think sometimes um, people think since I work at NASA, I'm around this stuff all the time. I'm not, right? I don't get to come down here nearly as often as I'd like. So it's just as exciting for me as it is for anybody else in this room. When you think about all the hard work that our team has put in to get us to this day, um, to actually come down and be a part of it with them, um, it's, just an, it's, just, it's just overwhelming and incredible. So uh, we're just a little bit excited. All right, Gabe Sherman, NASA's Chief of Staff. We appreciate you joining us today and enjoy the launch. Uh, I certainly know you will if we were able to get that one off. We're going to toss this back now to Hawthorne, California. Joining us now is SpaceX's Lars Blackmore to discuss SpaceX's future ambitions to visit the moon and Mars. Thanks for joining us again today for a second round. You're welcome. Could you tell us just a little bit about your background and what you do here at, space, at SpaceX? Yeah, well, uh, I'm in charge of entry and landing for Starship, which is our, SpaceX's next rocket uh -huh. after Falcon 9. Uh, mm -hmm. And before that, I worked for many years on the same thing uh, for Falcon. Um, so hopefully today you'll see another one of those landings on a drone ship. Awesome. And speaking of that, what role does reusability play uh, in getting people to the moon and Mars in the future? Well, it's really all about making human space flight affordable. And what you want for that is a 100% reusable rocket. Now, Falcon is only partially reusable, mm -hmm. but Starship is going to be 100% reusable. And we've actually already started working with NASA on using Starship to send astronauts to the surface of the moon for the first time since 1972. Not only that, Starship will be refuelable on orbit. And the combination of those two things will let us send people basically anywhere in the solar system with more payload for less money than I think people have really been contemplating. I think for the first time, we can seriously talk about things like lunar bases or what SpaceX cares about most, a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. Right, so what you're saying is I will have an opportunity soon to get on board one of those spaceships. I, I very much <laughs> hope so. Yeah. So speaking of reusability and landing, um, I, I know you mentioned Starship will be refuelable uh, in orbit, but Falcon does come back and land back on Earth. What, what are the challenges with landing, actually landing on the moon and landing on uh, a planet like Mars? Yeah, well, you, you can't land like a plane because the Moon and the Mars either have no atmosphere or have a very thin atmosphere. And, and even if you could, there's no runway that someone's built for you. So that's one of the reasons that we do propulsive landing on Falcon, because we want to figure out how to do propulsive landing. That fundamental architecture works on basically any planet. If you have no atmosphere like the Moon, you do a propulsive landing burn all the way. If you have a thick atmosphere like Earth, you let the atmosphere slow you down as you float down and do a short landing burn at the end. And for Mars, which has an atmosphere but a very thin one, you do something in between the two. Wow, yeah, that sounds really difficult. Um, and I'm sure there has been a lot of effort put into that. Um, can you tell us anything about um, what we're working on now to get us to a point where we can do a landing like that in such a harsh environment? 
Yeah, so figuring out propulsive landing is really the key part of it. But what people may not realize is that every time we bring Falcon back, we do something called an entry burn. So just mm -hmm. before we hit the atmosphere, we light the engines to slow the rocket down. Mm -hmm. That happens high up where the air is very thin. And it just so happens that the conditions there are very similar to what a Mars landing burn would look like. So even though it takes months to get to Mars and you can only do it every two years when the planets line up, we effectively get to practice Mars propulsive landing every time we bring Falcon back, including hopefully today. Wow. And as you mentioned, every time we bring Falcon back, we learn something new. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we learn uh, after the, the vehicle has returned and we're able to check out the vehicle? Yeah, so uh, Jessica actually mentioned this earlier that, you know, I, I talked about how cost is really one benefit of reusability, but reliability is the other benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine that you do all this planning to send a rocket up through the rigors of launch and re-entry, but you don't get to see the rocket afterwards. Um, and what, what we would like to do with the reusability, what we've been able to do with Falcon 9, is see the rocket, inspect it, and because of that, we've been able to correlate our models pre-flight to what actually happens when you launch, re-enter, and land a rocket. Right, instead of just guessing what happened to the exactly. vehicle after it's left. Exactly. That, that is amazing. Well, thank you again for joining us today for You're a second welcome. round. Hopefully the weather works with us today in a couple hours, actually. Um, let's throw it back to KSC with Marie. All right, actually, we have Lauren here. Now, today's mission opens up the door to one day allowing the general public to be able to visit places like the moon and Mars. And as you've heard through uh, several interviews today, reusability is a really, really important part of that. Imagine if every time you flew a plane from LA to New York, you threw it away at the end of the flight. That would mean essentially airline travel would be too expensive, costing hundreds of millions of dollars a flight, and almost no one would be able to fly. And so that's what SpaceX is trying to do here with reuse, allowing um, not just a handful of people to be able to go to space, but tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of regular folks like you and me to be able to, to go to space. So, you know, myself, you know, when people like me have a chance to go, I know my dream is to land on Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, scientists believe that there is a liquid water ocean underneath the ice and that it has the potential to be habitable. And so I'm super excited to get up close and personal to maybe some space fish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leland, what about you? Where would you go? Wow, that's a pretty interesting destination. Um, I think I would like to go to Mars. We've, we've studied Mars so much and looked at it and I think maybe having a Martian base that is dog friendly you know, mm. bring the pups along. Yes. Because I think as we explore, we want to take our families, our cultures, our traditions, you know, with us. And, and you know, flying with Doug and Bob is cool, but, you know, having more people, yeah. There's See? the dogs. The puppers, taking the, the puppers to space. I mean, you know, they, they're not- <laughs> They look ready to go. They too. are ready to go. <laughs> we just needed some, maybe some like SpaceX type suits for them, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's, uh, it's, that's what it's all about, exploration. Like the settlers going, the West, you know, they mm -hmm. took everything with them and they started these new communities and these new new traditions. And I think that's what we do with space travel. We start new traditions and communities and bring everyone together as one one family, one civilization. Absolutely. We're here for it. And knowing that the opportunity to fly to space as a private citizen is really just right around the corner. We have a new poll question on Twitter for you. If given the opportunity to fly to the moon, now we're talking the moon, would you fly to the South Pole where no one has ever been? Or would you go to the Apollo 11 landing site? So those are going to be some interesting answers. And while there is not a ton of cargo on today's mission, Dragon is carrying two very special payloads, aside from Bob and Doug, of course. <laughs> The first of those payloads is a series of custom art pieces entitled Humankind by Los Angeles artist Christian Tristan Eaton. These indestructible double-sided paintings made from gold, brass, and aluminum celebrate how far humanity has come as well as how far we still have to go. It includes a beautiful homage to the Saturn V rocket as well as a nod to Bob and Doug's current ride to space. And you can find more images and information about these pieces on SpaceX's social channels. 
Next, in the spirit of inspiring the next generation of explorers, we wanted to celebrate the class of 2020, from kindergarten all the way to graduate school. So SpaceX and NASA invited students from around the world to submit their photo to fly on America's first human space flight in nearly a decade. Each graduate's photo was used to create a mosaic image of our beautiful planet Earth, which we printed and it's now being flown aboard Bob and Doug's flight on the Crew Dragon spacecraft. We received nearly 100,000 photos. That's a ton, so thank you and congratulations graduates. Yeah, I've got a couple of family members and friends who submitted their photos, oh, wow. so they're super <laughs> excited about <laughs> seeing their faces go to space in that beautiful mosaic. That that's was really great. cool. And again, that's what it's all about, you know, everyone coming together with their experiences and bringing them forward to, to space. And I, you know, I think regular people flying to space, I mean, we're, SpaceX is going to be flying, you know, non-government people, non-military people, mm -hmm. but people that have a desire to explore and do new things and traditions off planet, as we say sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, f all this time since we've had the International Space Station, it's been government astronauts performing the research because you're the only ones we've been able to send, right? But well, we've I mean, had some tourists, though. We've had people that paid their way on a Soyuz rocket. Sure, to sure. Go. But it, it's, a very, it's, it's really the billionaire boys club, you know? That's what Pharrell talks about with, you know, it costs so much money to go to right. space. And I think that price point will come down as we make this more, you know, more amenable for everyday people. Absolutely. And then eventually being able to fly artists and musicians yeah. and poets, people who can tell the story of what they've seen out there in a way that really connects to the soul of people down on Earth so they feel exactly. inspired to go. Exactly. Now following today's mission, we will be one step closer to a future where we can all have that opportunity to gain the orbital perspective and explore new worlds. In just over an hour from now, Bob and Doug will be the first people to launch on an American vehicle in almost a decade. And for the SpaceX team, if I can try to speak for all of us, which is impossible, but I will say it has been an absolute honor to have the opportunity today to have this stage to show the world what we've poured our hearts into over the years with our partners at NASA. And it's just deeply humbling to know that the agency and that Bob and Doug have entrusted us with this critical mission. The, the responsibility that's on our shoulders is, is huge and, and we're just so grateful to be here today. Absolutely, and I know that you know our NASA teams really share in that sentiment. Um, we heard we heard from just a handful of them earlier when Bob and Doug were riding out to the launch pad. But there are just there's so many people that we're you know we're probably never going to see or hear from on the public stage, but that have poured their hearts and souls, as you said, into this mission. Um, you know, all the engineers up late hours, checking, double che checking, triple checking everything um, to troubleshoot and solve problems and get us to this point. So um, it's, it's just really awesome that we've made it to this point. When you think about legacy, Katherine Johnson who helped get John Glenn to space, mm -hmm. her daughters are watching right now. Mm -hmm. And that, again, that legacy going forward to the future of space travel yeah. is powerful. Wow. And we heard from two icons of science and exploration on Wednesday, and we couldn't resist sharing these shout outs with you one more time. Wow, we're making history again, the NASA program. I am there with you guys in spirit. Bob, Doug, good luck. I know you'll be fine. I'll be watching and got everything crossed, arms, legs. I'm tied in a knot. Can't wait for you to get back safely. This is the first time a US built rocket has taken people into space in nine years. It's quite an accomplishment. So for us at the Planetary Society, more rockets means more exploration. More people in space means more exploration. More countries involved in the endeavor of spaceflight means more exploration. This is how we know the cosmos and our place within it. So congratulations, SpaceX. Here's wishing your team and the crew especially a safe journey and the joy of discovery. Let's go. So great to hear from William Shatner and Bill Nye, uh, two um, very recognizable faces following along on the mission. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we want to go over to Dan and Jesse in Hawthorne, where we are now just one hour and 18 minutes from launch. Dan, Jesse. 
Hey, thanks, Murray. Yeah, one hour, 18 minutes. I think we're tying ourselves in knots, just like Captain Kirk. We're, we're really hoping the weather cooperates. In about 20 minutes or so, we might clear. So we're getting hopeful. We're getting yes. our hopes up. Yes, yes. Very excited. Again, we're T minus one hour and 18 minutes from launch. And we are, the anticipation is real over here. <laughs> Since arriving at the spacecraft, Bob and Doug were helped by our closeout engineers to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air, pressurized nitrox, and a communications link to Dragon Systems. They conducted leak checks, which were successful, and communications checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person who will speak to them directly throughout the mission, as well as the launch director in Florida. This is where they are checking their calm path through both ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites that we'll use to talk to the crew the entire way to the station. And after all of those suit leak checks were successful, the closeout team was able to get out of the uh, Dragon capsule and seal up that hatch, which also got its own leak check and was confirmed successful. At this point, the closeout team is out of the pad. They're away from the BDA, the blast danger area, and weather operators are about to kick off their final checks on wind speeds at the pad, which are going to be used during the final go, no go for launch. So we're all keeping eyes on the weather right now. Before we get to that final go, no go, all the various teams, both NASA and SpaceX, are going to do internal go polls, just making sure conditions are right with Falcon 9, the Dragon, the crew, the range, and the space station before the final go is given. So let's check back in with the man over in Houston, Gary, for a status and the team supporting the space station for their readiness for launch. Thanks, Dan. The team here in Mission Control Houston remains go for launch. We're also very hopeful about that weather. All systems on board the station that are required to be healthy for this mission are continuing to look good. Chris Cassidy is uh, wrapping up his workday and will be watching Bob and Doug launch here uh, in just under an hour. So station power and communication systems are normal. Computers and networks used for monitoring Dragon's approach have been checked out, and the cabins and the station cabin's atmosphere and pressure are as expected and ready to welcome two new crew members aboard. Mission Control will be closely monitoring Bob and Doug's flight and checking off milestones for most of the flight, and this very same team will be coming back tomorrow to be ready when Dragon gets in range of the International Space Station and we begin integrated operations and prepare for Dragon's docking. So I'll send it back. International Space Station team here is ready for launch. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and Godspeed to Bob and Doug. All right, thanks, Gary. If you are just now joining us, you picked a really good time. We're just a little over an hour to launch. And welcome to our coverage for the mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Liftoff time still holding for 3.22 p.m. Eastern, tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon. Everything good with the range so far. We're just really keeping an eye on that weather. Over the last three hours, our crew members, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin, donned their SpaceX suits in the historic crew quarters suit-up room. After that, they walked out of crew quarters, just as every astronaut to fly from space from this port has done since Apollo 7. And then they were transported over to the pad, where the crew members entered the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft that were looking in live. Today is a historic launch. It will be the first time a commercially built spacecraft will launch people into orbit and the first time the U.S. has sent people to the space station from American soil since 2011 with the retirement of the space shuttle program. Over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch, have Bob and Doug arm the launch escape system and begin fueling Falcon 9. Launch is set for 3.22 p.m. Eastern. This will include a 12-minute flight to orbit and then a 19-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station uh, tomorrow morning. Today's mission is the culmination of years of work between teams at SpaceX and NASA. Demo 2 is going to be an end-to-end -end flight test starting with this launch today, going on to dock with the space station tomorrow, and then splashing down at the end of their mission. And this is going to be the final test for NASA to certify SpaceX for regular crew flights to the space station. We've been hearing a little bit from the crew on board Dragon, which you can see on your right screen. They are currently strapped into their seats and already through communications and leak checks. They're able to follow all the milestones still ahead on those display panels just above them, getting insight into all Dragon and Falcon 9 systems as we proceed towards launch. 
So at T minus one hour and 13 minutes, let's check in with John I for a status update on the vehicles. What's the update, John? Thanks, Jesse. Well, not much, add, not much to add to what uh, Dan and Jesse just brought up. We've had a smooth countdown this afternoon. SpaceX team is working no issues as the pace begins to pick up here in the last 70 minutes. On Falcon 9, we did uh, get the team on console. Earlier, you heard the comm checks between the responsible engineers and the crew. Uh, the engineers will be making calls on Ascent for the crew's benefit, so they want to make sure that uh, they could hear them before we go. The propulsion checkouts of the first and second stages are beginning right now. We're watching them begin to go through the process, opening valves. That check will go for about another 10 minutes, and that'll be our last one until propellant loading. Now the team will assess readiness for launch with a final go-no-go pull at T minus 45 minutes, and that'll be followed by propellant loading starting at T minus 35 minutes. Now earlier today, Dragon operators also performed a series of checkouts of Dragon's flight systems. The spacecraft is also currently go for launch. Our NASA crew, astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, are currently inside Dragon. The hatch is closed. The SpaceX ground crew has left the tower. The next major event for Dragon is retract to the crew access arm that you can see currently alongside the capsule. That'll happen somewhere between T minus 45 and T minus 42 minutes. Now the range is currently clear for launch from historic Pad 39A. The worldwide network of ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. The weather, that's the one concern. We will get a weather brief at T minus one hour, so just under 12 minutes from now. Currently, the ground and upper altitude winds are go, so that's one thing that we can check as green. Uh, at the uh, current time, we did have some rain earlier that appears to have let up, but we are red on conditions for both the electric field at surface levels, lightning, and cumulus clouds. There is a expectation that a forecast that will be coming up at about T minus one hour also uh, may give us clearance of those conditions. So everything is focusing now on the weather brief at T minus one hours. Also, we should hope to hear about the final check on the ascent corridor. That's the weather along the Atlantic seaboard in case Dragon had to abort on the way to space. The conditions there have been marginal, but the expectation that it would be good for launch. But we will get all of that coming up here very shortly prior to entering propellant load. Now today we are aiming for a launch at 3.22.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time or 19 hours, 22 minutes, 45 seconds universal time. Once we begin loading propellant, there's no opportunity to change T0. So once propellant is loading, we're committed and we'll get one chance at it today. But currently at T minus one hour, 10 minutes and 30 seconds, everything except the weather is go for launch. Thanks, John, for that detailed update. We've got an extensive history now of flying Falcon 9 from the Florida coast, and just last year completed a test run of the mission we're less than an hour from beginning here today. The purpose of that mission was to demonstrate Dragon's capability to safely and reliably fly to and from the International Space Station. The success of Demo 1 was a really exciting moment, Falcon paved 9, the way for today's mission starting. to where we are today. And right now we're getting ready to fly U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time since 2011. Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. As I mentioned earlier, SpaceX has successfully completed 21 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, including 20 trips to the International Space Station. Not only have we conducted thousands of hours of testing, we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. Much of what was learned with the Cargo Dragon was leveraged in the design of this new vehicle. It's fully autonomous, which means it can basically fly itself, but also features that full manual override capability just in case of emergency. And many of the other enhancements help towards SpaceX's goal of reusability and less refurbishment time between missions. So let's take a closer look at these advancements. 
standing at almost 27 feet tall from the very bottom of the trunk to the very top of the nose cone, Crew Dragon's comprised of two main elements. You have the capsule, which is designed to hold crew and pressurized cargo, and then you have the trunk, which holds unpressurized cargo as well as having a solar array and radiator. And the nose cone at the top of the capsule protects the docking system as well as the guidance navigation control system, or what we call GNC. The nose cone opens for docking and remains attached to the Crew Dragon spacecraft, and that's unlike the previous version of Dragon, and that helps towards our reusability efforts. Completely opposite the nose cone is that trunk. It has attachment points for Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and it can hold cargo. On the very outside of the trunk, one half of the of it contains a radiator that rejects heat from the active thermal control system into space. That's the white part, and that uses SpaceX's new Pika tiling technology. The other half contains the solar cells used to charge the spacecraft's batteries. And though we only have two astronauts on board today, the spacecraft is actually designed to accommodate up to seven crew members with modular seats that can be removed and replaced by additional cargo. The seats are made of carbon fiber and are custom sized for any crew member flying on board. The control panel is centered right between the pilot and the commander seats and has those three touchscreen displays that gives the crew insight into Dragon and even the ability to operate the vehicle and fly it manually. And finally, our Super Draco launch escape system is a key safety feature of Crew Dragon, giving the crew the ability to safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit. And as we look to the future beyond this test flight, later this year, the first operational crewed mission for NASA will take place. NASA astronauts Mike like Hopkins... Captain, on that. Try to review your launch commit criteria and indicate readiness at the appropriate time. Step 5469 for propellant load and launch. That's a good sign. That was the launch director. We're getting ready to pull the teams as we move towards that go, no go for propellant loading, which happens at about 45 minutes before launch. But back to our Crew-1 mission, NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and Suichi Noguchi of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, were chosen to support this mission. And bleeding Again, it's called and crew one but today, Doug Hurley is the spacecraft commander for this mission. He previously flew on two space shuttle missions as the pilot on STS-127 and STS-135, which was the final space shuttle flight. Here's a closer look at Doug Hurley. Excited? Very excited. Yeah, very excited. Are you ready to go Oh, yeah. I think we're ready. Uh, I think we're certainly ready. Joining the SpaceX Demo-2 test. He is a Marine Corps colonel and test pilot. He was selected as an astronaut in 2000. He piloted Space Shuttle Endeavour and Atlantis for STS-135, the final Space Shuttle mission. Introducing NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. It's a life-changing process in so many ways to fly into space. It's just overwhelming in some, some respects. Just the sensations, the rumbling, the shaking, the acceleration. My name is Doug Hurley, and I'm the spacecraft commander for the Demo-2 mission to the International Space Station. This will be the first time the Dragon had a crew on board, and so there's a a, a myriad of objectives we want to achieve for this mission. What would work on orbit, what might not work on orbit, what would definitely work. To be able to just have the entire integrated uh, team that's going to support us getting to and from space station, it was really neat being part of it. You know, we are the lucky ones that get to fly it, but we certainly not for one second take for granted the amount of effort that so many other people had to put into this to make it successful. For Doug personally, he's, he's worked so hard, I mean, through his entire life, um, to get to where we are right now. As a test pilot, this would be the dream to fly a new vehicle. So it makes me so happy to see that he gets to be part of this mission, the spacecraft commander. I'm just glad to see his hard work and his dream has come true for that. 
It's been a long road in a lot of ways for not only us, but certainly for all the folks that work in the commercial crew program, as well as SpaceX in our case, just working to get to this point. And we're a little over one hour, three and a half minutes away from launch. Now let's learn a little bit more about the man sitting next to Doug Hurley inside Dragon, NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000, uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. For me personally, as a spouse, watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years, um, the dedication that he's shown, the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that, uh, you know, that my spouse appreciates and I love her for that. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. Really, my role on the Demo 2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team, um, helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this, now there's another capability in the U.S. besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. I want to thank the entire Commercial Crew Program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles and a launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. If we look even further into the not-so-distant future, flying on a mission to space will be an option for more people as SpaceX plans to also fly private astronauts on board Dragon. Earlier this year, SpaceX signed an agreement with the space tourism company Space Adventures to fly up to four passengers on an orbital trip aboard Dragon as early as next year. And of course, it's NASA that is making private astronaut missions to, to the space station a possibility. We are looking forward to these missions and we hope that you guys are all too. All right, we are just 20 seconds away from T minus one hour. This is going to be a really big moment that everyone's going to want to listen to. We're expecting a weather update, obviously hoping that the weather is improving. And so we should find out in the next 10 seconds or so. So we're going to stand by for a moment and wait for the core to give Bob and Doug a call. And then we'll all hear Dragon the latest. SpaceX, we're at T-minus one hour. You are go for section six. When ready, report go for launch. We'll put it in work. And that right there was a call for the crew to refer to some of their procedures. They do some final checks. You can see them checking harnesses, checking helmets, just making sure that they're strapped in and ready to go. And once they're done with that, the crew will report their readiness for launch. SpaceX Dragon in six decimal four, Bob and I are go for launch. 
Copy, go for launch. And next up will be go to GoPo at T minus 45. Dragon Cap. All right, the crew is go for launch. So we are inside of one hour, still waiting for the weather update. But I mean, this day, this day is one for the history books. We're returning crewed launches to station from American soil on American rockets. It's been almost nine long years since we retired the space shuttle program. I remember that day. I'm going to remember this day. It's been a long road to get here, countless hours by thousands of dedicated professionals from NASA and SpaceX. It's been an exciting week, but this last final hour is just so exciting right now. Today's mission will be Crew Dragon's second test flight and its first test with humans on board. It's been an awesome countdown so far. Weather, we're still waiting for that update, so it's still a watch item, but the crew is go for launch, so at T minus 45 minutes, hopefully we'll get an update on that weather. We've had a really clean countdown so far. It started with suit up just over three hours ago. The SpaceX team helping Bob and Doug put on their suits, conducting initial checkouts, including an initial pressure and leak check before they got to the actual walkout. And all of that done in that operations and checkout facility. The crew walkout was where Bob and Doug gave their final goodbyes to friends and family gathered outside the operations and checkout building before they began that roughly 20 minute ride to pad 39A. Really touching moment, saying goodbye to their family, both their, their wives and sons right in front of them. Yeah, it's, very touching moment. It's incredible to be able to watch these moments. And as they got into their Teslas, we got to watch them ride all the way to the pad and we got some great footage there. And as you can see on your screen, this is some playback from earlier of them getting into those Teslas about to make that drive down to the pad. And once they got to the pad, they did take a minute to take in the sights and they headed up the fixed service structure to begin the process called crew ingress where Bob and Doug entered. The, and there you can see on your screen as they're coming through the crew access arm, entering the white room right before they are able to ingress into the vehicle there. Again, yeah. this was from earlier. Yeah, this all from earlier. And as we said, that white room, the last place on planet Earth, they're standing before they climb into Dragon for the ride uphill. SpaceX carrying over a tradition that NASA had had where that was traditionally the room from uh, Gemini, Apollo, and the space shuttle, that last place. Um, about 30 minutes ago, we're back with some live video here. The team was able to close Dragon's hatch with Bob and Doug safe inside. So we are under an hour ago. Things are going to pick up as we get close to that go-no-go no go to begin propellant loading and then arming the launch escape system. The crew pull for readiness was completed at T-minus 60 minutes, and the Dragon pull for prop load is coming up here in just about 30 seconds at T-minus 55 minutes. And then following that will be T-minus 45 minutes will be the internal mission control Hawthorne pull and then the launch director's pull for propellant loading. When we get to about T-minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract and Bob and Doug will get the call to close their visors and arm the launch escape system. This is the automated system in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket, either on the pad or during the flight on the ride uphill. And then once we reach T-minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. We got there on Wednesday. We got all the way down to about 17 minutes before launch before we had to cancel because of weather. But we're still, we're, we're optimistic right now. Conditions have been improving. And so we're looking to press ahead once again into loading fuel onto that Falcon 9 rocket. Throughout the countdown, we've been getting some incredible views of the astronauts inside Dragon just making all of their final preparations, some close-up views of their suits and on the displays as they just are strapped in and ready for launch. 
The teams often describe the suits as an extension of that Dragon spacecraft. You can always think of it as a mini spacecraft inside of a spacecraft. It's got <laughs> all of the life support, everything that they need, just like the capsule This is the on Countdown 1 technical poll is complete. No constraints to proceed into launch escape system arming and propellant load. And there's that call out that the crew is ready. They are ready to load prop onto Dragon. So we are pushing forward towards T0. And while those suits do look great, they are also engineered to, correct, to connect directly into Dragon seats to provide communications, cooling, and the ability to pressurize if necessary. All right, well, we did get the call out that the technical teams on the ground are ready for launch escape arming and propellant loading. Again, things starting to pick up, things really mm -hmm. starting to feel real. Let's jump down real quick to the team at Kennedy, see if you guys are just as excited. I can't sit still right now. It's starting <laughs> to feel real. Yeah, it's it's hard to sit still in here, right, Leland? <laughs> 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 that rocket fuel going through my veins still. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's so awesome when we see them sitting there in their suits. We're less than an hour away now. So far, things look like we we right. might make it. We might make it. Um, so I, I want to ask you what it was like the first time you put on a space suit when you knew you were going to space. Oh, that was uh, February of 2008. We were in the ONC building getting the pumpkin suits on. A little bit different than the SpaceX, mm -hmm. fly SpaceX suits. <laughs> but um, it was, uh, was kind of surreal, you know? And to think that all of these, I took 10 years of training to fly in space. Mm -hmm. It took me 10 years from when I got in the core in 1998 to flying in February of 2008. So it was a long road to get there, but it was so worth it and so sweet. And, you know, learning how to use the green apple, the connections for oxygen, for cooling, much different than these suits that we have here with SpaceX. And so it's a lot more complicated to, to, to go through that whole series of things that you have to do to make sure you're safe in the suit. But we've evolved, we're ready, and uh, they look so cool and calm and collected in their, mm -hmm. their suits and in the vehicle. They're focusing and getting ready to fly in space. And there's so much excitement around the center. I know, Leland, you've been getting some messages. You got another message from another astronaut. Yeah, Sunny Williams. Okay, so Sunny, She's Lauren, kind of the best. She's, she's the best. Sunny she's a, she's is a, awesome. She's a commercial crew also. She's she was one yeah. of the original cadre. She was one right. of the original four who trained with Bob and Doug from the beginning of the commercial crew program. And she one of my classmates. Look at her there. What is uh, she wearing? There she is. Hey, the Sunny. meatball. The, I forgive you, Sunny. <laughs> <laughs> no, she had the worm one on, on Wednesday, <laughs> so she wore the meatball today. So she's it's the a, best. <laughs> but now she can wear the the, what, the worm ball. I guess. Yes. The, the worm ball. Yeah, she can she can mix it up. But yeah, Sunny's awesome. She's training to fly on the Boeing Starliner uh, in the not too distant future. So really glad she's watching and showing some love. Uh, so thanks a lot, Sunny, for for sending that note. And again, we're looking at a live view of the crew dragon on top of a falcon 9 rocket uh, you can see the crew access arm to the right of your screen that's the hallway that bob and doug walked down uh, to get into the white room which was the last place we saw them standing up before they climbed inside dragon and again the wider shot there of launch complex 39a uh, where we are inside of an hour from liftoff and i think we're just a couple minutes away from the the uh, pole we're going to hear before they start propellant load Again, a two-stage rocket there. And gosh, you guys, the weather looks, it looks not that bad. I mean, uh, obviously that is not an official forecast, uh, but it, it doesn't look quite as bad as it did Wednesday. We've got yeah. a little bit better odds. So uh, there's the countdown yeah, clock. We're two helium. We're gonna pause to listen to that calm. If you're just joining us, we're less than 50 minutes from the scheduled liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket carrying Crew Dragon. And if we start to hear a, any kind of update on weather or polling, we will pause to listen in for that. Uh, but if things go as scheduled, we should be hearing uh, 
the launch director verify go for propellant load at about T minus T minus 45 minutes. So we're going to send it over to Hawthorne to carry the ball. John Innsbrucker or, or Jesse, are you there? This weather is go at this time. Dragon copy, go weather. And there you heard that call out. So far we have good weather. We are go for launch today. This is getting really exciting. I don't know about you, Dan, but my heart is beating pretty fast right now. Yeah, we've <laughs> we've been waiting for those words since Wednesday. <laughs> oh, and yeah. And we did, we did hear a call to the crew just in case you missed it that they were only tracking one final weather constraint. It was the cumulus cloud rule. They were expecting it to clear up within 10 minutes and it's cleared up now. So we are currently go on weather. Yes, and it's been pretty incredible to be so close to launch, and the road leading up to this point has been pretty incredible as well. It has been. It's been a partnership between NASA and SpaceX. We've been working together since, we, since SpaceX started flying cargo to the International Space Station, now getting ready to launch crew. And we've been really fortunate to work with not only a lot of international partners on the International Space Station, but a lot and of really a reminder companies. here in the control room. We'll be uh, closing doors here uh, once we start with uh, propellant load. Any last minute uh, uh, bio breaks, please go ahead and uh, accomplish those in the next few minutes. And the launch, the launch director just getting the teams ready. We'll be coming up on that propellant loading again. That starts at about 35 minutes prior to liftoff, so in about 12 minutes from now. There's going to be a go, no go coming up really soon. So let's go over to our man, John I, for the latest. John? It's T minus 47 minutes, 24 seconds. We're continuing to count down. As you just heard, the launch director and launch team are preparing for the readiness for launch pole. Now, the launch director is currently checking with Dragon Mission Director, NASA launch manager for their readiness. And actually, it sounds like everybody is good there. The launch director will then ask the team, he'll tell them the pole is open. And the 13 members of the SpaceX launch team will be electrically pulled for their go to load propellant as well as continue all the way to launch. Now we will hear that poll results and a briefing from the launch director at about T minus 45 minutes. The good news right now is that the weather is go. All the conditions that were read shortly uh, a while ago at T minus one hour have cleared. We're is the weather forecaster said cautiously optimistic. Uh, Currently, countdown. the probability Pole is complete. We're go for propellant load. Well, we got an early call out there. And launch from... control clear to retract the access arm on time. Cover that arming access arm retract at T minus forty five minutes. Got an early call from SpaceX launch director Mike Taylor that the pole is go. He also heard the direction, T minus 45 minutes to prepare for retract of the crew arm. As we hear more discussion, we'll stop and let you listen in. But right now, weather for liftoff, ground level winds are good, 10 to 15 miles an hour, well within limits. Upper altitude balloons show that conditions are acceptable. The red weather conditions have cleared up, the last one being cumulus clouds. And the probability of violation is set at 30% right now. So that's 70% chance of good weather. We're continuing to watch. There is about a less than 10% chance of lightning. We're also watching the abort corridor off of the Atlantic uh, coast. In case, for example, at stage separation, Dragon had to abort into the ocean. The conditions there are acceptable. There has not been lightning lately. The weather, uh, winds are good, light rain. It is go, but NASA is going to continue to watch those conditions. T minus 45 minutes and counting. Reminder on hold and launch escape protocol. For non urgent no go conditions, brief the CE or LD, and they will approve a boarding launch auto sequence and proceed to launch abort. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will immediately abort the launch auto sequence and proceed to the launch abort auto sequence. Operators shall also advise launch director whether structural break or fire is imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. A reminder on fire alarm instructions, in the event of a fire alarm, 
Key operators previously briefed will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personal safety is threatened, evacuate the, to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. At this time, weather is go for launch. You can see on the screen, we're inside T minus 40, we're T minus 44 minutes, five seconds. Crew access, access arm, arm retracting has away. Begun. SpaceX launch director is given the final brief to the crew. And we will begin a propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes. So right now on Falcon 9, we're ready to get into propellant loading. Dragon, crew, getting configured, set up. The arm is pulling away. The range is go for launch. They continue to monitor the air and the sea space. Everything looks good. And we finally have gotten green across the board on the weather conditions, but we can't uh, take a deep breath quite yet. We're gonna have to watch the weather all the way down to T0, both here at Kennedy Space Center and out in the Atlantic in the abort zones. Now earlier we saw many of you following the launch from the United States on our hotspot map. Now that we're inside an hour, we're seeing large numbers of folks logging on, tuning in from coast to coast and around the world. So we'd like to know, is this your first time watching a launch live, not counting Wednesday? And if not, how many have you seen before? Tell us using the hashtag LaunchAmerica from your favorite social media platform. And with that, at T minus 42 minutes, 50 seconds, conditions are go, and we are counting down for an on-time launch. Let's send it back Draw over to Kennedy Space Center as the action begins to pick up on the pad. Dragon, SpaceX, you are go for Section 7, close visors and arm launch escape system. We will put Section 7 in work, visors come and close. All right, the countdown clock is continuing to tick. My heart is continuing to beat five million beats a second and we are getting so so close uh, dragon in 7.2 visors are closed we're arming launch escape system copy and as you just complete. as you just heard the crew is arming the launch escape system that is one of the absolute last big milestones uh, prior to liftoff other than nominal falcon operations So just a minute ago, we saw the crew access arm retract, and obviously we just heard on the comms, uh, Bob and Doug getting ready to arm the launch escape system. And so that is something that protects them all the way to orbit. So when, when fueling starts at about T minus 35 minutes, so just over six minutes from now, they will have the capability to abort uh, to separate from Falcon 9, either on the pad or even after liftoff. Um, that's a critical safety capability. And we are going to go over to Hawthorne now to take us through these next minutes. Jesse? Section switch in to nitrogen. Switch in to nitrogen. And we did hear that call out that they are arming the launch escape system, so very exciting. SpaceX has designed a Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 to be the safest launch, launch uh, system ever flown. Uh, so we brought back Nick Picone, SpaceX's Nick Picone, to talk more about this again. Thanks for coming back and joining us today, Nick. Hey, Jesse, happy to be here. Uh, still <laughs> monitoring the launch here with our recovery and ground operations teams. Awesome. And Nick was our mission manager for our in-flight abort uh, test earlier this year and now works on the Starlink team. Um, Nick, on Wednesday, you uh, talked about the launch escape system. Could you just give us a brief summary today for those that are joining today? Sure. So the launch escape system, again, is our, uh, our ultimate safety feature to keep Bob and Doug safe in the event of a, a major Falcon anomaly on the pad. The system is designed to automatically fire if either vehicle detects a dangerous condition developing. And if that happens, Dragon will use its eight Super Draco engines to push the capsule off and away to a safe distance away from this Falcon. Um, this, this capability is absolutely critical. Um, it's what keeps the crew safe uh, and we're now active and armed on the pad uh, with it protecting the crew. And as you mentioned, the launch escape system allows the to Dragon to separate and get away from the vehicle. Um, I believe it goes into the ocean. What what happens after it lands safely in the ocean? 
Correct. So for most of our failure modes, the successful end state is Dragon deploying parachutes, splashing down safely in the ocean. But since a launch escape can happen while the vehicle's on the pad or anywhere in flight up through orbit, uh, it could be splashing down right off the coast of Cape Canaveral. It could be splashing down thousands of miles away in the North Atlantic. If that happens, to make sure we can get to Bob and Doug as, as quickly as possible, uh, the Space Force's 45th Space Wing, Task Force 45, has pararescue teams staged and ready uh, all around the world, um, ready to drop in and, and rescue Bob and Doug as soon as possible. And you mentioned that the launch escape system will keep them safe all the way up to orbit. Uh, what, what other options are there after Dragon is in orbit? Sure. So if for any reason we're unable to dock to the International Space Station, uh, we have several pre-planned return trajectories, which will bring the capsule down to a splashdown point close to shore, uh, where NASA and SpaceX recovery forces will be waiting to recover them. Um, it'll look like an otherwise totally normal um, recovery operation, except for the early end of mission. Um, this, uh, this operation is something we're doing with one of two identical crew recovery ships. We do that because uh, the landing sites, we want to maintain as much flexibility as possible. There could be changing weather conditions that bring down one site and leave the other one up. Uh, so we have those two identical ships, one in the Atlantic, one in the Gulf of Mexico. And our space operations team can redirect the spacecraft to go to whichever site uh, is the safest option for the crew at that time. And with the vehicle, in almost any scenario, it sounds like the vehicle will land into the ocean. And that's a, it, it may look like a gentle landing into the ocean, but it's a pretty dynamic event happening. Um, and you mentioned there, there are teams that are ready to go and um, go and rescue the vehicle and the, the astronauts on board. How do you prepare for something like that, especially with so many different scenarios that could happen? Sure. So we're lucky to have had about a decade of recovery experience with Cargo Dragon 1 uh, in our previous trips to the International Space Station. Um, that, along with our booster recovery missions, we've got a great team of recovery operators here who have a lot of offshore experience with our spacecraft. Um, the system, though, that we, we, we took that experience, we built up a new crew recovery ship, uh, two identical crew recovery ships, I should say, uh, which have a lot of those lessons learned baked into the design of that ship and the operations. These new ships have complete medical facilities, an operational helipad, and redundant communications, power, and propulsion to make sure they're robust and ready for anything we encounter offshore. We've also done tons of training exercises with SpaceX team, the NASA team, and the rescue forces I mentioned earlier, practicing capsule recovery, emergency scenarios where we have to get the crew out of the capsule while they're still in the water, um, as well as those helicopter evacuations taking off and landing from the pad uh, many times so that we make sure the team is, is ready to do that. Uh, they're all staged and ready. Um, they feel ready to support and uh, will be ready to call on us if, if anything goes wrong today. Awesome. It sounds like Bob and Doug are in some really good hands and will be safe no matter what um, uh, occurs uh, on the vehicle. So thank you, Nick, for joining us again, for, for walking us through all of those details. I hope you're just as excited as we are for a launch coming up here very, very shortly now. So we're going to send it over to KSC to Lauren. Thank you, Jesse. So as you just heard, fueling is about to begin at T minus 35 minutes. We are about uh, 50 seconds away from that. Um, and so we're getting really, really close to the first launch of astronauts into orbit from American soil since 2011. The launch escape system is armed, which as you know, happens before fueling. And Dragon propellant load, that's the, the, the propellants that are inside of the Dragon capsule, not the rocket. Prop load for Dragon took place weeks ago and just a, a few miles down the road in what we call Dragonland. And those propellants, they are MMH or monomethyl hydrazine, which is uh, the fuel that we use, it's hypergolic fuel and NTO or nitrogen, nitrogen tetraoxide, that's the oxidizer. Those two come together and they ignite in space to propel the vehicle. You don't need that uh, T-TEB or a, a third thing to ignite because uh, um, hypergolic propellants don't require it. You just oh need the fuel and the oxidizer. And as you just heard, uh, propellant load has started on Falcon 9 and that's awesome. All right, so that uh, th that bipropellant system feeds all of the engines on Dragon. So Dragon has 12 service section um, engines in each, so there's three in each quad. 
three, 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 and three. Those are used for on-orbit maneuvering for Dragon. There's also four additional Dracos that are underneath the nose cone for large Delta V maneuvers mm -hmm. that the vehicle perform. But the engines that uh, that Nick Pacone was talking about earlier are Super Draco engines. Uh, we have two in each quad of the vehicle, so eight total, and those are bigger engines with a high flow propellant system, and those are what lift Dragon off of Falcon 9 in the unlikely event of emergency that requires us to get off of Dragon, mm -hmm. off of Falcon. Now, um, you probably remember, uh, let's see, a Mercury, Apollo, Soyuz, mm -hmm. they have that big pointy tower on top. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the launch escape system for those vehicles. It is actually just another rocket on top of the spaceship that lifts the vehicle off. Um, in the case of Dragon, our escape system is integrated into the vehicle uh. completely. And so that's one, just better from a one less thing you have to jettison every single flight. Um, but it also allows us to have escape capability from the pad before T0 all the way through to orbit. And so even if the very last minute, if we needed to get off of stage two while we're in space, we could actually escape to orbit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's the escape system for for a little, little baby dragon here. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Lauren, and, and thanks for, for walking us through that because I think it's really important that people understand um, that critical safety capability, and that's, that's the whole point when we hear that launch escape system right. is armed. What that means is that in an instant, they can separate from Falcon 9, shoot up into the air, and they can splash down safely in the Atlantic right. Ocean under Dragon's parachutes. And it was designed to do that. So um, now that fueling is underway, we're, it's been uh, going on for about two minutes now. So they have that, saf that safety capability uh, ready to go on standby in an instant if they need it. And so we want to go over to Hawthorne now for an operational update from John Innsbrucker. John? Send fuel and stage two fuel, all flow rates tracking nominally. We're at T-minus 32 minutes, counting down these final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon for an on-time launch. Falcon 9 did begin propellant load at T-minus 35 minutes at planned. Now on the Falcon 9, we use a fuel and oxidizer as the propellants that power it. The fuel is commonly known as RP-1. That's rocket propellant grade one kerosene. The oxidizer is densified liquid oxygen, also called LOX. Densified means it is kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles. This allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. Now with the fuel and oxidizer on hand, we need an ignition source to complete that fire triangle as we call it. For this, Falcon 9 uses a fluid called T-TEB. It ignites in the presence of oxygen and gives off a green colored flame. Now it's hard to see on the first stage ignition due to the water that will be spraying on the pad, but you might just see the green flare as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation over two and a half minutes into flight. Now currently first stage fuel tank is about 10% full. The first stage as a reminder, as you look on the left side of your screens, the first stage is the long white cylinder at the bottom topped off by the black cylinder. So over two thirds of the rocket is that first stage. So the fuel tank is getting loaded. We're also loading the liquid oxygen into the first stage also. The second stage, which is the top one-third between the Dragon and the uh, black cylinder, uh, that's the white second stage, that is being loaded with fuel right now. That's about 8% loaded at this moment. Liquid oxygen loading is going to begin on second stage at T minus 16 minutes 30 seconds. Liquid oxygen loading will continue on both stages all the way down to the last few minutes of the count. We're also loading helium into pressure vessels on the stages. That's used to pressurize tanks in flight as the propellant is pulled out by the strong Merlin turbo pumps. On board the Dragon spacecraft, astronauts are monitoring systems while the propellant is loaded into Falcon 9. While we did, we mentioned we had trained them with sounds that we had recorded on board. They've been through most of the propellant load and they are now experiencing those sounds and vibrations. 
Stage one, the range helium continues mode started. to report no problems. They are go to support launch. Weather, the last of the red conditions cleared up about 15 minutes ago. Everything is marginal but acceptable on the weather. We'll continue to watch all the way through the countdown. Now, as a reminder, today we are now into an instantaneous launch window now that we've begun propellant loading. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we'll have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity tomorrow, May 31st. Thanks, John. For Demo 2, Bob and Doug's flight to station will take about 19 hours, and their journey is fairly similar to the trip our Cargo Dragon makes back and forth to the International Space Station, but with two noticeable differences, and that's docking and splashdown. And as we await T-0 in just under 29 minutes from now, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure Dragon and Falcon 9 are both ready for liftoff. And we're continuing to get live views inside the capsule with Bob and Doug, and you're now also looking in firing room four down there at the Cape. Once we hit T-0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon make their ascent until the Falcon 9 first and second stage separates and sends Dragon on its way to the space station. And at this point, mission operators will prepare Dragon for on-orbit operations, where the vehicle will execute a series of burns that gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the space station, as you can see in this animation. And just after putting Dragon into the same orbital plane as the station, the teams will get ready for Dragon's approach and docking maneuvers. The next Dragon will make its approach and actually dock with the space station. And this is a very different process from what we've seen with Dragon cargo deliveries in the past, which use a process called berthing. Berthing requires a spacecraft to approach the station and then stop so a crew member can maneuver the station's robotic arm to capture the spacecraft. Docking on this version of Dragon can be done autonomously with no crew on board the station. It's typically a faster process, both when arriving and leaving, but it does still require pinpoint accuracy to approach safety. Once captured, a spacecraft then gets attached to a common berthing mechanism, the same type of port that we use to connect each of the modules on the station together. It's a little bit slower of a process, but the hatches are significantly larger than the docking ports, which makes them perfect for bringing up those really big cargo items. Dragon will spend up to 120 days docked before preparing to return home. Following successful completion of Dragon's test objectives and cargo loading operations, the crew will close the cabin, perform final system checks, and configure the vehicle for undocking. Once the automated undocking sequence is complete, Dragon will complete two departure burns using its Draco engines, pushing it away from the space station. And then next up on the trip, deorbit entry and landing, or splashdown which is gonna cover all the operations following that final departure maneuver. That's gonna include events like the trunk separation, closing of the nose cone, a deorbit burn, and then eventually as they get into the atmosphere, the deployment of the drogue and the main parachutes, and all of that ends with splashdown right off the Florida coast. At that point, teams from SpaceX will move in with their recovery ship, grab the capsule out of the water and work to get Bob and Doug out of Dragon after a successful mission in space. So we are 26 minutes away from launch. Fueling of Falcon 9 is continuing. Let's check in one more time. Down with the team at Kennedy. Murray? All right, thanks, Dan. We are so pumped right now because things have cleared up and it looks like we might actually do this today. If you're just joining us, we are now 25 minutes, 46 seconds and counting from the first launch of astronauts Thank to the International Space Station from U.S. soil in nine years. This will mark the beginning of a new era where more people will be able to fly to space than ever before. And we wanna share with you the results of a poll we asked a little earlier. If you could go to the moon, now it's not where the astronauts are going today, they're going to the space station, but if you could go to the moon, would you rather visit the South Pole where no one has been before or the Apollo 11 landing site? And it was a pretty even split. We had. 46% of you say you would go to the moon's South Pole, and 54% of you would go to the Apollo 11 landing site. 
I kind of side with the Apollo 11 landing site because I'm a history buff and I want to see where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot. So I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Lauren, wh which place would you go? I'd come with you on that one. And I would love to go see that flag there and mm -hmm. those footsteps, those footprints there should still be there, right? There's they no should wind still be there. Still be there. Yeah. Leland, how about I, you? I think I'm with both of you because it's just like, you know, the meatball, you know, the classic. Yeah. Going to the classic spot and that's where all of it started. That's where all that inspiration came, even though I was an antenna engineer not seeing it. But <laughs> besides that, that's that's history. And hopefully, uh, maybe it wouldn't have to be one or the other. That's true. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, w yeah, w we're gonna learn more from going where we've never been before. Exactly. And so we exactly. need to go to the South Pole too. Mm -hmm. um, and we are thrilled to see all of you following along online. Thank you for answering our poll. And we're gonna go over to Tahira, who's been monitoring all the action with uh, less than 25 minutes to go. Tahira, I'm sure things are heating up online. Hey, Marie, I mean, you're completely right. Now that we have that go for launch, people are on the edge of their seat right now, waiting on this historic moment to take flight. As you can see, photos are still coming in of just everyone around the country showing their excitement for this launch. And it's really been a touching thing to see how everyone's kept this excitement going from Wednesday's first attempt. So we just took a look at numbers and we are now over 3 million people tuning in for this historic launch. And so for me personally, I just want to wish Bob and Doug the best of luck. This will be my own first time watching humans lift off to space from the United States and it's just going to be a super emotional moment. For that, Marie, back to you at Kennedy for these last minutes before launch. All right, thanks to Hira and Leland, we got 23 minutes and some change to go. What do you think Bob and Doug are feeling right now? I think, you know, they I mean, they're very calm, cool and collected as test pilots, but mm -hmm. I think they're thinking about what are the steps that I have to take if, if a malfunction or something happens. And so the nominal stuff is all kind of automated, but if something happens where they have to intervene with those touch screens, that's what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And we are, we're just inside 23 minutes now. So on Wednesday, we were five minutes further in the countdown when we heard that call to scrub and we uh, the weather was still very touch and go at this right. point on wednesday but today it, it f at least for right now i don't want to jinx that i'm afraid <laughs> to even say it out loud but it looks better today yeah and it it, it feels like whew, I, i'm feeling it a lot it more right. than i yeah. did it on wednesday right. and you know speaking of bob and doug and them being really calm and, and cool and collected haven't had the opportunity to be in meetings with them and to watch them train uh, i have to say and, and and to all of my friends who work with them every single day the the feedback is always just what great people they are right. mm -hmm. and just how not just bright and sharp they are but just good people right. and uh, around the, the office we often refer to them as the dads yeah. the dads they're what the is that? dads they, they, they're, they're dads they are dads okay. and we've met their families and when you when you when you see people on that very personal level it starts to mean so much they're they right. are a part of our team you yeah. know they're they're not a customer they're our team they're not a payload they're right. our team they're yeah. a family and so we're just so excited to see the dads up there today yeah <laughs> go dads <And> yeah <laughs> All right, we, we're gonna go send it over to uh, Gary for an update from Houston. Gary? Hey Marie, the uh, space station team here is focused. All eyes are on the system checks that are happening across the board and we're listening in as we close in on launch and I can tell you that things are looking very good. Chris Cassidy will be watching from the International Space Station right now flying over the Pacific Ocean and it's heading to cross right over the launch pad. We might even get some good views from the station. I uh, hope to be capturing those. We'll have the launch view on the big screen up front, and everyone's excited to see our two crew members on their way to the International Space Station. But before we get to it, I just want to pass on good luck from the entire flight operations community here in Houston. It's always exciting to be doing something wholly new and history-making with station operations, and we can't wait to see our team members Bob and Doug in low Earth orbit and heading to the International Space Station. That's it from us here in Mission Control Houston. I'll send it back over to the team in Hawthorne for the latest happening there. John. T minus 20 minutes, 30 seconds. We're Strong continuing to started. count down. Everything is still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon. 22 minutes, 45 seconds after the hour. Stage right two, now on RP the right hand side, you can see a large white cloud coming off of the Strongback. That is normal. As we get ready to load the second stage with liquid oxygen, we have to chill in the plumbing lines going up that strong back. 
And so as we relieve pressure, the moist, humid Florida air condenses around it, and that gives you the cloud. So that tells us that things are actually on schedule. We did begin propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Fuel loading on the second stage, I believe we just heard the call out that it is complete. First stage fuel load is continuing, and right now that's a little more than, uh, that's about 60% of the way full. So things are looking good. Second stage is getting ready to begin the liquid oxygen loading. After they finish chilling in the lines that you see on the monitor, they'll begin the load at T minus 16 minutes and 30 seconds. The range right now is go, ready to support. Weather continues to be go. Uh, as we inch our way closer, uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, we're waiting to uh, hear if anybody calls out an issue, but for the moment, as you can see on the screen, it looks good. Now on the Dragon Tide, the Dragon Mission Director and the team there are reporting no issues. They've done their communications checkouts. The crew access arm, as you can see, is retracted away from the spacecraft. The crew is strapped in and they are ready to go. Now final instructions will be going to the crew at T minus 10 minutes. The crew displays will be configured for launch and that setup will give astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant updates on vehicle health. We've already heard the crew give their go, close their visors, and get ready for launch. For Dragon, it'll enter terminal count at T minus five minutes. When it transitions to internal power, we'll hear continued callouts on the countdown net as we get close to zero and to liftoff. But right now at T minus 18 minutes, 15 seconds, everything continues to be go for an on-time launch. So Dan, Jesse, things are looking pretty good. How are they doing over at your stand? Things are great from about 15 feet away from you, John I, and honestly, things are looking pretty great down at the pad there. We're seeing a lot more blue in the sky. Green is the color we want when we're talking about weather, and that's where we're sitting right now. So we're continuing to count down. We are under 18 minutes away from liftoff. Again, it's an instantaneous liftoff um, at, uh, it's gonna be 12, 22 and 45 seconds here on the West Coast, 322 and 45 seconds over on the East Coast there in Florida. Just a reminder, it's going to be about a nine minute ride up to orbit for the Falcon 9 and Bob and Doug on board Dragon. It'll be a two stage flight. So we'll see the first stage fly until we hear Miko or main engine cut off about two and a half minutes into flight. After that, the second stage will take over and continue to power them the rest of the way. Second engine cutoff comes in just under nine minutes at about eight minutes and 44 seconds. Following that second stage completing its job, it'll continue to coast for about three minutes. It'll do a, a slight attitude adjustment and null out any rate, so make sure it's not in any kind of a spin before they do separation. So that's when the Dragon spacecraft will physically separate from the Falcon 9 vehicle and Bob and Doug will be flying free. It's about a 19 hour ride if we launch today on time. So that means Bob and Doug will get on orbit. They'll have a number of burns or those firings of those Draco thrusters that they'll do over Stage two, several... locks load started. We hear the locks, the liquid oxygen load has now started on stage two. But again, they're gonna be doing a series of burns on the way uphill towards the International Space Station 5 spread out over the, the first 16 hours or so of their flight until they get much closer and it's time uh, for that approach and docking. And we are expecting that with an on-time launch to happen today, uh, that'll be coming tomorrow in the afternoon. All right. Now that we're under 16 minutes away, we have a special guest joining us. I'm going to toss it over to Jesse. We are T minus 15 minutes and 45 seconds from liftoff of our second demonstration mission today. And we have the honor of having SpaceX's president and COO, Gwen Shotwell, join us. Thanks, Gwen, for coming out and taking a few minutes to chat with us. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> we know you've been on console. Um, how's the countdown been going so far in there? Countdown is clean today, just like it was Wednesday. Uh, we did clear the weather hurdles sooner mm -hmm. uh, than we did on Wednesday. And the only thing we're watching right now is downrange weather and lightning at the staging location. Of course. But we will clear that hurdle at uh, T minus seven minutes. 
Awesome, great, very exciting. Um, now I'm gonna throw it back to 2012 because you were on console for Dragon when it was first making its way to the space station. How does that experience compare to today? Two boxes on the DPU. So, uh, uh, I was nervous anomaly. then. I stopped getting nervous for launches. Today I'm nervous again. <laughs> Super nervous. Stomach and throat. Understandable. Um, no, it's a fantastic, fantastic day today. I'm really excited. The team is pulled together. It's such a professional operation. And when I say team, by the way, I mean SpaceX and NASA. This, uh, these folks have been working incredibly hard and have done an, a, a fantastic job. Yes, and we are all so excited. And um, we know that you have to get back into inside of Mission Control, but is there anything that you wanted to say before liftoff to NASA and SpaceX? Well, I want to thank NASA, of course, uh, for their, uh, their generosity and their help with getting to this place. I want to thank all the SpaceXers who have come together uh, to make this moment uh, in history. And uh, I want to thank Elon for hiring me. <laughs> <laughs> we thank Elon for hiring you as well. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. We'll let you get back to Mission Control. Um, and good luck with launch today. Thanks, Jesse. And Godspeed, Bob and Doug. <laughs> Well, we are so excited. We are just a few minutes away from countdown. So we are going to turn it over to Dan and John for the final minutes in terminal count. Uh, take it away, John. T minus 13 minutes, 30 seconds, continuing to count down. We are continuing to load fuel onto the first stage. That should finish up in uh, just about six minutes. Fuel is completely loaded on the second stage. That's closed out. And we are continuing to load liquid oxygen on both the first and second stage. The liquid oxygen load beginning on the second stage uh, just uh, about three and a half minutes ago. We are also loading cryogenic helium into the storage vessels on the first and second stage, getting in the last little bits of helium when we keep it uh, cryogenic, cold and liquefied. That gets us, uh, just like we do with liquid oxygen, the maximum amount into the storage volume so that we can get the most performance out of the vehicle. Right now, we are in a fairly quiet state on the vehicle. Ground pumps continuing to put the propellant in to first and second stages. Next significant issue, callouts that we're going to hear will probably be inside the T minus 10 minutes when uh, they talk to the crew. We'll listen for that. But at the moment, everything continuing to look good at T minus 12 minutes and 20 seconds. Getting real close now, John. It's only a little over 12 minutes away. Just a reminder for everybody, it's about a nine minute ride uphill. We'll have some dueling boxes going on as that first stage is gonna be coming home while the second stage is carrying Bob and Doug into orbit. But obviously we'll be keeping an eye on our astronauts the whole way uphill. Some of the calls that you'll be hearing as there will be what we call performance calls over the dragon to ground the entire way uphill and you'll just hear uh, some of the SpaceX engineers calling out uh, trajectories and booster uh, performance. So we're always looking for that word nominal. I know that's one of John's favorite words. That's one of mine too. We wanna hear nominal as much as possible up on the way uphill. You might also hear some number and letter combinations and those correspond to the different abort zones that Bob and Doug are in during their flight uphill. There's one A and one B which signify that they're on the first stage. Those carry them from there in the Cape all the way up to about the very top of North Carolina. And then we'll have 2A through 2E or 2 Echo. And that will be on the second stage. And that goes from North Carolina all the way up to about the tip of Newfoundland. Uh, so in the Northern Atlantic. And then there is a zone of the Northern Atlantic that we're going to avoid. And so you should hear the call out be something similar to forward to Shannon and that just refers to Shannon, Ireland, which uh, they'll be going off the coast of Ireland at the later stages of the uh, second stage if they have to abort. So just prepping you now for some of those calls, you're hopefully gonna hear that word nominal a whole lot on the way uphill, 10 and a half minutes. Things are pretty quiet. As John I said, it'll pick up at right at about 10 minutes. We'll wait for the crew just to confirm that they're displays are in order the crew is already strapped in and reported that they are go for launch 
and we'll continue to watch the fuel gauges tick up on the Falcon 9 vehicle until fueling cuts off at just about two minutes prior to launch. Dragon and SpaceX confirmed displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon displays are configured for launch. Copy. Bob, Doug, on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, it's been a huge honor to help you get ready for today's historic mission. Know that we're with you, have an amazing flight, and enjoy those views of our beautiful planet. Thanks, Jay. Uh, it is absolutely our honor to be part of this uh, huge effort to get uh, the United States back in the launch business. Uh, we'll uh, talk to you from orbit. Thank you. Copy all. Thanks for those words. The SpaceX core. So again, that voice that's going to be talking to Bob and Doug throughout their mission from right here in Hawthorne. Just offering a few quick words the crew did confirm their crew displays are configured for launch we are coming up on nine minutes and counting we've gotten through t minus 10 minute with the crew discussions activity is now going to switch over to falcon 9 our next major event comes at t minus seven minutes we begin what we call engine chill pre-valves will open those currently separate propellants uh, on the first stage from getting down to the merlin engines We'll open the pre-valves, that'll allow fuel liquid oxygen to flow to the top of the pumps. And more importantly, when we open uh, the valves, that'll allow us to begin chilling the nine Merlin 1D turbo pumps on the first stage engine. It'll take a few minutes to get them cold enough to where they would then be ready to pass the large amounts of liquid oxygen through the pumps and into the main thrust chambers when we get to engine ignition at T minus two seconds. We don't want to try to run uh, highly chilled liquid oxygen through a warm pump. Uh, you would flash that into gas, and running Starting gas through a high-speed pump press. is not a good thing. So right now, we are waiting for T minus seven minutes. That'll start the engine chill. Shortly after that, we will also get the fuel shut down. listening to the SpaceX launch director in the background there. As I mentioned, at T-minus seven minutes as we start the chill, we will also get into the uh, final topping off of stage one fuel, and then the fuel load will complete. Stage one and stage two engine chill has started. We've heard the call out. Stage one engine chill has started. That's gone up to the crew so that they've got situational awareness. As I mentioned, the pre-valves are open. And now we are topping off for stage fuel, getting ready to finish the fuel load. Liquid oxygen load on first and second engine stage pressure. will continue until the last three to two minutes of the countdown. We should hear that call out RP-1 load complete coming up at about six minutes. Again, RP-1 is just that densified kerosene or that rocket fuel that Falcon 9 is going to be used to power Bob and Doug to orbit today. And stage one fuel is closed out. Right on time. That call out indicates that the fuel loading on the first stage uh, is complete. Draining back the lines now. So first stage and second stage fuel are complete. Liquid oxygen loading is continuing on both stages. You can see on the view on the left side of the monitor, the condensation, uh, the cold gas wrapped around the stages as the tank skins are chilled by the densified liquid oxygen picking up the humidity Falcon from the Florida air. Line. Looks like at this moment we're a little more than 90% full on the 
oxidizer on the first stage ticking up towards that 80% mark on the second stage. We'll be counting down all the way till about two or three minutes, as John and I just said, until everything is loaded. Falcon 9 Falcon heaters nine. closing out. And then we will be go for launch. Dragon has transitioned to configure for terminal count. Vehicle tanks pressing for strong back retract. We're pressurizing the Falcon 9 tanks. We're going to open the clamp arm around the second stage and begin to retract the strong back. We'll move back about two degrees. That'll get us to the liftoff position. At liftoff, the strong back will then recline about 45 strong degrees away. Started. Stage two, RV1 bleed. Launch director called out the strong back retract has started on the left. You'll see it go back just a couple of degrees. Stage one, RPM lead. We are just four minutes away from liftoff. Again, at this moment, Bob and Doug are really just laser focused on those displays. They have insight directly into Dragon and the Falcon 9. They're able to see where their fuel loading is at, how everything's progressing down with the count. AFTS final setup started. Three and a half minutes from launch. And the strong back is now reclining away from the Falcon 9. And back igniter purges. I'll go bleed. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. Stage one, locks load close out. Okay, we're at T minus two minutes, 42 seconds. Stage one, locks load is closed out. Stage two, will continue to load for about another half a minute or so. Once we get the completion of stage two locks loading, we have to vent down the line so you'll see another large white cloud coming off of the strong back. That'll be normal. That'll happen Nicole around transitioning to T minus power. one minute and 40 seconds. We're going on internal power now. Just a few seconds away from the stage two locks load being complete. It's been almost nine years since we've been in this position. A lot of work done by thousands of people to get to this point. All our eyes focused on two now. Stage two, lock float is closed out. Propellant fills are complete. Dragon is in auto idle. Stage two, locks load complete. All fuel, all oxidizer on Falcon 9. One minute, 34 seconds to go till launch. Ground gas closeouts is starting. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. FTS is armed for launch. Under a minute now, the FTS, the flight termination system, has been armed. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX, Dragon, we're go for launch. Let's light this candle. T minus 30 seconds.
Stage one tanks pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Bob and Doug. America has launched. And so rises Copy. a new One era alpha. of American space flight. Stage one and with it, the nominal. ambitions of a new generation continuing the dream. 20 seconds into flight, stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 30 seconds into this historic mission. Flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9, and look at them go. Falcon power telemetry nominal. M1D throttle down. We're throttling down to get ready for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We're in the throttle bucket. Reports say all systems are go. Vehicle is supersonic. We've exceeded Mach 1 on the Falcon 9. M1D throttle up. We're throttling back up to full power as we're through Max-Q. Copy, one Bravo. And we heard that one Bravo call out. That's just the second abort zone that they're in. They'll continue to be on this until the first stage has done its job and they switch over to the second. At this point, Bob and Doug pulling about 2.3 Gs, 2.3 times the Earth's gravity, already moving at over 1,500 miles per hour. We've heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. That's getting the MVAC engine ready to light. That'll come at about 2.44 into flight. Right now, everything continuing to look good. Next major event coming up is going to be the triple. We'll have main engine cutoff of the nine first stage engines, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine to continue to carry astronauts into orbit. Coming up in about 20 seconds. M M1D throttle down. We heard we're throttling down the Merlin engines on the first stage. And we have Miko. Miko. Two Alpha. Falcon stage separation confirmed. Copy, two Alpha. MVAC ignition. All right, we have stage separation confirmed. The first stage beginning its flight back. The second stage being powered by that single Merlin 1D vacuum engine has ignited and is now carrying Bob and Doug into orbit. So they're going to continue under the power of this second stage. Stage two propulsion is nominal which will cut off at SECO, or second engine cut off, at about eight minutes and 44 seconds into today's flight. So a little over five minutes to go still on this second stage. You heard the call out to Alpha, so they're now in the longest abort zone that carries them all the way from about North Carolina up the eastern seaboard almost to Canada. Things looking good, though, getting good call outs, nominal propul pul propulsion on that second stage. Bob and Doug continuing to make their way into orbit. Dragon SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Acquisition of signal in Bermuda. SpaceX Dragon, nominal trajectory. All right, here in nominal trajectory, so Dragon pointed in the right direction, continuing to make their flight uphill. Heard acquisition of signal Bermuda, that's one of the other ground stations that they're using to get telemetry and data back from this spacecraft. Stage two propulsion is still nominal.
a little over four minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Bob and Doug flying at more than 5,600 miles Dragon per SpaceX hour. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. Already almost 200 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Nominal trajectory continuing. And while they continue uphill, it looks like we are getting a view of the first stage as well. Yep, on your right screen, you can see that first stage with the grid fins deployed. It's making its way back to attempt to land on our drone ship. Of course, I still love you today. And we're just about a minute, uh, a couple minutes away from the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine Merlin engines do ignite to help slow the vehicle down as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. And then after the entry burn will be the landing burn, which is just a single engine Dragon, burn. SpaceX nominal trajectory. And you heard nominal starting chill for entry burn. There's that call out. They are still on a nominal trajectory on Dragon, still on second stage. And that's that MVAC engine on second stage on your left screen. Again, on your right screen is that first stage booster coming back towards our drone ship. Of course, I still love you. We're about a minute away from entry burn. Meanwhile, that second stage continuing to power Dragon into orbit. Again, if you're keeping an eye on that timer, that's going to continue to burn until 8 minutes and 44 seconds into flight. So a little over two minutes from now, we'll hear the call out Seco. It'll then be a little stage under. Stage two propulsion is still over. good a little over three minutes until Dragon physically separates from the second stage of the Falcon 9 after the upper Dragon stage SpaceX, gets a chance. Dragon SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Dragon Tappies, nominal trajectory. Continuing to check in with Bob and Doug as they are on a nominal trajectory. Just about 10 seconds away from that first stage, starting that entry burn on your right screen. We should be able to see that view live. Stage one entry burn startup. And there is that entry burn Acquisition beginning. Burn. This burn lasts about 36 seconds long. Stage two FTS is saved. That entry burn continues. We're just about a minute away from SECO. We'll have a number of events all happen in rapid succession. Uh, it'll Talking be the shutdown. second engine cutoff. Stage one we'll be looking for down. that uh, stage one landing burn shortly after. Yeah, actually, just within a few seconds of each other. It's such a cool view on your left screen, seeing Bob and Doug on Dragon. Right now you can see the displays that they are seeing right now themselves. Terminal guidance. And back throttle step. We are coming up 25 seconds or so away from SECO, or second engine cutoff. This is also the point where Bob and Doug are experiencing their highest G-force. We're seeing the counter tick up to right about 1.8. Copy, Shannon. You heard Shannon, so that just means they're in their final abort zones. If they were to abort at this point, would either be an abort to orbit or to land off the coast of Ireland. Standing by for second Stage one cutoff started. confirmation. And back throttle step. And back shut down. Stage one landing layer. Confirmation of Seco second engine cutoff. Now we are waiting for our first stage to make its way to our drone ship. Of course, I still love Dragon, you. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal orbital insertion. Launch escape system is Nominal orbital insertion. Nominal orbital insertion. And what you're seeing on your screen is a live view of our drone ship, where our first stage will be coming down. Looks like we lost that live view, but we'll wait for confirmation of that landing shortly here. Falcon 9 first stage is successfully landed. And there you can see on your screen, Falcon 9 has landed. 
This is the first Falcon 9 to carry humans to orbit, so very exciting for us. And as you can see on your right screen, Bob and Doug are still making their way to their targeted orbit. Have one need to recovery one. So exciting today. Come on, <laughs> it doesn't stop. It does not stop. All right, we did we did hear again that call out good orbital insertion, so that means Falcon 9 and Dragon right now exactly where they're supposed to be. Can we need to FRC on recovery one? And it's right at about 12 minutes when Can Dragon will separate. Looks like we saw a zero G indicator floating around there. I know Bob and Doug owe us a little bit about what exactly that is that they brought up with them. <laughs> and before separation, before Dragon initiates separation from the second stage, they do make sure to make, they, they do ensure that the vehicle is not spinning and it is in good con condition before we separate. That's right, the upper stage does small attitude maneuver using some cold gas thrusters built into the rocket body itself. Exactly, so we do expect that separation to occur in about a minute from now, but they do wait until they have full confirmation that it is ready to separate. Such cool views. I cannot get over this view that we are seeing right now. Bob and Doug on the right screen, inside of Crew Dragon, out in space. Yeah, already 200 kilometers over planet Earth, or a little over 124 miles, traveling in excess of 2,700 meters, 27,000 meters per second, or about 16,000 miles per hour. Again, we're just standing by. That separation event should be coming up shortly. Then they'll begin a series of checks on the Draco thrusters that are going to be used to maneuver and then power Dragon on its flight to the International Space Station. Standing by for separation. Expected loss of signal, wallops. It sounds like we had an expected LOS loss of signal with one of the ground stations. Waiting for confirmation now of that. Dragon setup. separation confirmed. Dragon separation and confirmed. <laughs> there is a great view right in front of you Countdown of Dragon December. separating. Separation confirmed. And there's that call out. Dragon is now officially making its way to the International Space Station today. <laughs> Dragon SpaceX with that separation call. Uh, we have a few words for you from our Falcon 19. Standing by. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to Ground. Bob Doug, on behalf of the entire launch team, thanks for flying with Falcon 9 today. We hope you enjoyed the ride and wish you a great mission. Thanks, Bala. Congratulations to you and the F9 team for the first uh, human ride for Falcon 9. And it was incredible. Uh, appreciate all the hard work and uh, thanks for the great uh, ride to space. Copy all. Good luck. Like Proud of you guys and the rest of the team. Uh, thank you so much for what you've uh, done for us today, putting America back into low Earth orbit uh, for, from the Florida coast. Copy all. Good luck. Godspeed. All right, so Bob and Doug are in and Dragon space. Dragon SpaceX, we confirm nominal eclipse activation and service section Draco checkouts. A nose cone deploys in progress. Copy all, we're monitoring. The core here in Hawthorne giving the crew a heads up that we have confirmation the nose cone is deploying. So again, that nose cone is going to open up a little bit more than 90 degrees, goes up to about, I think, 105 degrees, and that's going to expose uh, the actual docking ring and the hatch that they're going to be going through once they attach to the International Space Station. And also four of those Draco thrusters, we call them the forward bulkhead thrusters, that are going to be used for these major phase burns or firings of those thrusters to actually raise their orbit gradually over the coming hours. Also heard good activation of the ECLIS, that's the Environmental Control and Life Support System. That's everything controlling their atmosphere. Uh, just keeping Dragon a nice, safe, habitable environment 
where they're going to be living for the next 19 hours until they arrive at the space station. Right, exactly. And Falcon 9's job may be done for today, but the mission is not over. Crew Dragon's job is not done. As you can see, Bob and Doug are still inside Crew Dragon making their way. It will be a 19-hour trip to the International Space Station before they dock tomorrow morning. And such cool views. I love that we can get these live views here and see and watch what they're doing now that they are in orbit. Yeah, it's, it's incredible to just be looking over their shoulder to be along for the ride. And we're going to be with them and we're going to be with all of you the entire way uh, for their journey to the space station. We're going to be covering live throughout. Uh, Bob and Doug will obviously have a sleep period uh, where they'll get about eight hours of sleep a little bit later today before they wake up for all of their final approach. Uh, one of the major things we are looking forward to in the next couple of hours is going to be their first turn at the controls. So they're actually going to be using those touchscreen displays to take control and manually pilot Dragon. We'll walk you through what that's going to look like. And assuming we have some good ground station coverage, we'll be able to get views from right inside Dragon, looking over their shoulder as they manipulate the controls at the display. But, I mean, it, we had a, a smooth ride uphill, both stages of the Falcon 9 doing their job, placing Bob and Doug in orbit. I mean, this is, this is a day, this is a historical day. This is us kicking off that new era of space flight that we've all been talking about and longing for since the space shuttle program came to an end in 2011. Yes. And the weather, the weather cooperated. Yes. Second time's a charm. <laughs> right. All right, so day for the history book, books. As you can see, we have lost some live signal there, but the mission still continues, and we're going to send it over to KSC um, to continue uh, broadcasting live Expected with you. Expected loss of signal in Newfoundland. Yeah, Jesse and Dan, we are just in awe over here. When I woke up this morning and looked at the weather forecast, I was like, Man, we're going to be back here on Sunday, but we we did it, we did and it. the room cleared out. Everybody was outside watching, and the and inside the lights were shaking, the cameras were shaking. Lauren came back in with tears in her eyes. <laughs> uh, this is really amazing. I, I I can't believe it. I saw it <laughs> with my own eyes. This is I, I'm a little bit speechless. Um, just so grateful that we got them up there and there's a lot more to go a lot more to go but i'm so happy they're safe right now i'm just so happy yeah leland you were talking <sighs> about it it's amazing what we can do when we work together yes american astronauts on an american rocket from american soil showing you what americans can do when we come together as a team and blast doug and and bob off to the cosmos this is this is what it's all about and their families and everyone is working together to uh, to take them up to space safely. So I'm, I don't know what to say. I'm, that rocket fuel <laughs> is still in my in my veins, and uh, I want to go get on the rocket. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's it's too late now. Maybe I the know. next one. I know. But Thank we want to go over to uh, Daryl at OSB2. The, he's there with the administrator, who um, hopefully has more words than we do, because we're still kind of speechless. Daryl. Pretty incredible here, Marie, at the operations support building, where a chorus of applause has been happening from the beginning of launch and throughout the various stages. Some very special guests were here to watch it. That includes President Donald Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, who joins me now. And you were with the President and the Vice President. Um, America's back launching human astronauts again. Tell me how you feel about that and tell me about the president watching the launch and what happened there. So this has been a long time coming. Um, it's been nine years since we've launched American astronauts on American rockets from American soil and now it's done. <laughs> we have done it. It's been way too long. I want to give a lot of credit to Charlie Bolden. He was my predecessor as the NASA administrator. Uh, he fought hard for this program at a time when it didn't get any, any support in Congress. Uh, we now have an administration that is fully supportive of, of our spaceflight initiatives, not just on the exploration, discovery, going to the moon, onto Mars, but also from a Space Force perspective. Our budgets are going up, things are strong, 
and today was just uh, it was an uh, uh, just an amazing day. You know, one of the things the president did right out of the gate when he became president is he created what's called the National Space Council, and he put the vice president as chairman of the National Space Council. And on that National Space Council, you've got the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Transportation, the Secretary of Education. Um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, all of these different um, amazing individuals that deal with space day in and day out. A lot of people don't realize how many parts of the federal government deal with space. And the vice president invited those members of the National Space Council here as well. So um, we, we just had, and then we had members of Congress, bipartisan members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats who have been involved in supporting this program. Um, you know, for, for a long time now. So um, I'll just tell you, I, I, I'm breathing a sigh of relief, but I will also tell you I am not going to celebrate until Bob and Doug are home safely. Um, tomorrow they're going to dock to the International Space Station. Tonight I'm heading to Houston to be at the, the Johnson Space Center uh, when that happens. So um, it is, it is a, it's a bit of a relief. The, the nose cone is now open. Um, it's now deployed, uh, which means that, um, you know, now we're going to go into some, some burns. We're going to have some phasing burns. We're going to have some, um, some, you know, boosting burns, and we're going to get uh, as much as we can in alignment with the International Space Station um, as early as possible here. But also, um, I know it's hard, but, you know, the big thing that we need to do now is <laughs> we've got to get Bob and Doug, who have now gone through this exercise twice. They need to get some rest. Um, but I, I can guarantee you there will be no rest for a good, a good amount of time while they're up there in orbit. And they are certainly on their way. And a lot of people joining us for this entire celebration and watching it. We just heard uh, 10 million people watching live as this launch happened. And President Donald Trump becoming the third sitting president to watch a launch live from the Kennedy Space Center. The first. Well, to be clear, the, I think he's the only sitting president to watch American astronauts launch on a brand new rocket that has never launched before. Uh, and uh, that's a big risk. You know, he also said we're going to go to the moon by 2024. That means he's, <laughs> he's putting himself at risk to say, look, I'm going to be accountable, potentially, I'm going to be accountable to the, the initiatives that I put forward. And I think that's, we have not had that kind of leadership for space in a very, very long time. And, uh, and we're, we're so grateful for it. What was it like watching the launch with the president, how did he react? Oh, I, I'll tell you, um, it's obviously something that um, is near and dear to him. He said it a year and a half ago, he put it in the State of the Union speech. He said, we're going to launch American mm -hmm. astronauts on American rockets from American soil. And of course, I was like, in my, in my head, I'm thinking, we better get, we better get after this. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, we've had, we, we've worked overtime to, to, to make it happen. Um, we might be a little behind schedule, <laughs> but we got it done, and we got it done safely we're knocking on wood um but um but so far so good it's looking good you personally jim as that rocket was lifting off and you felt that rumble yeah uh, what'd you feel what'd you experience well i was praying <laughs> i'm not gonna lie to you i was praying i was praying for bob and doug i was praying for their families i was praying for their safe return even though they're just going um but man i'll tell you it was uh i've heard that rumble before but it's a whole different feeling when you've got your own team on that rocket, and uh, and they are our team. They are America's team. This is Launch America. This is everything that America has to offer in its purest form. And times are tough right now. There there is no doubt. Um, we've got the coronavirus pandemic. We have other challenges as a country. But I hope this moment in time is an opportunity for everybody to reflect on humanity and what we can do when we work together, when we when we strive, and when we achieve. And if this can inspire a young child to become the next Elon Musk or the next Jeff Bezos or the next Sir Richard Branson, uh, then that's what this is all about. Or the next Jim Bridenstine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't put me in that category. but. Well, we appreciate your leadership for the space agency at this time. And congratulations on Thank an amazing you. day and the launch. Thank you. It's been a, a great ride. All right. Very good. Marie, we'll send it back to you in the studio. 
Doug and Bob are on course to arrive at the International Space Station tomorrow, May 31st at 1027 a.m. Eastern Time. And we'll be staying on the air for continuous live coverage along the entire ride to the station. So though our coverage here is concluding, we will turn it over to the teams in Hawthorne and Houston to take us through the next phases of the Demo-2 mission, all the way through hatch opening and a welcome ceremony on the space station for Bob and Doug tomorrow. That's right, and as you follow along we invite you to tune into a post-launch news conference that's happening here at 6.30 this evening Eastern Time on NASA TV. We'll have NASA and SpaceX leaders here to take questions live on this unprecedented achievement in human spaceflight. And in addition to NASA TV, you can follow along always on Twitter at, at NASA and NASA.gov for mission updates as it progresses. Here now are highlights from the mission so far May 30th, 2020, remember this day, you'll, you'll have this memory forever, the day America returned astronauts to orbit from U.S. soil. Wow, we're making history again. Let's go.